The Shifter Conqueror, a YA shifter romance, the Holder series, book two, written by Debbie Civil, narrated by Lauren Rodriguez. Chapter one, Security Breach. David ducked as the stainless steel six-inch throwing knife whistled past his head. His heart was pounding as his psychotic stepfather, Rune, grinned at the shelves laden with several types of throwing knives, all of which were sharpened to devastating points. Sheaths of many sizes were hanging from pegs on the opposite wall. The room smelled overwhelmingly of bleach, since shifters were known to fight over the blades they wanted to use on missions. It was too bad that David found himself in this room, since it signified that he was being punished. Rune smirked and tossed both weapons, the blades flying at David at inhuman speed. He avoided the first knife, only to be grazed in the left shoulder by the second blade. Pain made David's stomach twist as warm, sticky blood began dripping down his arm. Despite that fact, David knew that he had to stay on his guard because Rune would toss seven more blades his way. This was the punishment fit for the crime of daring to create a social media account. Nine years ago, David's mother found her holder. The one man fated for her. Of course, Rune paid no mind to the fact that Sharon had been married with a child. Nope. He bit the unsuspecting human, then abducted both his mate and her nine-year-old son. David hadn't seen his father since. However, whenever Rune felt like being cruel, he would show David videos of his father's desperate pleas for his family to be returned to him. It made David sick. How, after all this time, His father never gave up on Sharon. If only his father knew how his wife had surrendered to her kidnapper without a fight. It didn't matter that Rune's bite had made Sharon a lioness shifter that should fight for her son's freedom. It turned out that she had been bored with her husband and his frugal habits and longed for more. When David was young, He pleaded with his mother to allow him to return to his father. That request earned him two days locked in the dungeon with no food or water. He learned pretty quickly that if he wanted to escape, he would have to bide his time. The first time David attempted to run, it was when he was 14. Rune had lowered his guard by then since David had kept to himself and obeyed every command his tutor had given him. One day, one of Rune's pride mates carelessly left his keys in his truck. David jumped into the truck and had just left the estate when five lion shifters suddenly blocked the path of the truck. After a ten-minute standoff, David exited the car and expected to be placed in the dungeon again. Nope. Rune determined that David needed to be taught a valuable lesson. So, he had taken David into his weapons room and had instructed him to try to dodge the knife that he threw at him. David escaped four of the blades before the fifth sank into his stomach. Despite the severity of the injury, Rune continued to toss the blades at him. A shifter doctor had saved his life that day, and David was determined to escape Rune and his band of shifter assassins. Presently, David was nearing 19 and still hadn't found a way out. He had assumed that the way to escape was to create a social media page to connect with some of Rune's enemies. Thanks to his ever-watchful mother, David hadn't even gotten a chance to agree to the terms and conditions before he was yanked out of Rune's office chair and dragged into this cursed room. When are you going to learn, human? 
As long as my mate wants you here, you will stay. Rune snarled before making a show of winding up his arm and tossing the fifth knife at David's forehead. David flung himself to the floor, relieved when the blade fell to the floor beside him. As soon as Rune went to the collection of blades to select another one, David quickly picked up the fallen knife. It was lightweight and incredibly sharp. David knew that if he sliced Rune's throat, his mother would suffer. But after nights of sleep and food deprivation, waterboarding, and other torture methods, he didn't care what happened to her. All he cared about was returning to his father, who had run for Congress in hopes of improving the laws centered around kidnappings of children. Rune had tried to assassinate the congressman once, but since a shifter worked on his security detail, the attempt ended with the assassin's head being mailed back to Rune's estate with a short note. Michael Jabber is under my protection. Don't insult me by attempting to kill him. David overheard his parents discussing the events two years prior. That's why David had known that the best way out of his prison was reaching out to Michael for help. But since that wasn't going to be an option anytime soon, he supposed that pocketing a blade could be useful. Rune arrogantly allowed David to use the bedroom beside his. It would be risky, but he could get the drop on him. David had just touched the knife when a blaring alarm nearly blasted his eardrums. Oh, crap. The bastard figured out that I want to kill him. David thought to himself, but when his mother rushed into the room, her eyes wide with panic, David knew that something was going horribly wrong for the Katrine pride. He grabbed the knives closest to him and ignored the fact that one of them had drops of his blood on it. The alarm was so loud that he couldn't make out what his mother was saying to her mate. For a moment, David studied Sharon Sampson. She was tall, with long black hair, caramel skin, and curves that caused the males of the pride to lust after her. Her wardrobe consisted of short, barely there dresses and high heels. David had attempted to convince her to change her appearance, but that only earned him a night in the cold, dusty dungeon. David watched as Rune's eyes widened and he raced away. His mother stepped out of her death trap heels and tossed David over her shoulder, the quick movement causing him to drop his weapons. When Sharon sped out of the room, David's stomach protested as his mother's shoulder dug into it. He closed his eyes, hoping that preventing his eyes from seeing the rapidly moving floor would keep nausea from appearing. He grunted as his mother took a leap, which ended in the jarring impact of her feet hitting the floor. As soon as she landed, the smell of earth, unwashed bodies, and blood hit his nose. They were now in the dungeon. Without warning, David landed on the unforgiving concrete floor without mercy. He let out a groan after the impact. It was dark, so he couldn't make out his mother, who he assumed was still in the room. He supposed that the only saving grace was that the sounds of the sirens didn't reach this place. David, stay here. The Katrine estate is under attack. The last thing that I want to happen is for our enemies to use you against us. She said. This was a thing that David could never understand. Despite Sharon's cruel ways, she insisted that she loved David and didn't want anything to happen to him. And yet... Sharon allowed her holder to toss knives at him whenever he disobeyed one of his orders. And that would be such a terrible thing. David challenged. What could be worse than a stepfather that tosses knives at me and a mother that locks me in a dungeon? 
David waited for the slap that always came when he ran his mouth, but he heard a sniffle instead. Rune is right. You really are a weak human that doesn't have a backbone. No matter how much tough love I show you, you'll never get stronger. David wasn't surprised by Sharon's sentiments. His naive mother probably hoped that David would run toward the danger, despite the fact that he was a fragile human. But he couldn't care less about what happened to the Katrine Pride. If their enemies found him in the dungeon, they would either kill him, set him free, or find some other use for him. It was the thought that this unknown enemy could simply let him go that caused David to be a bit optimistic. Despite the fact that he had been kept away from humans for nine years, he was still hopeful that he'd find a way to escape. Isn't he always? David asked in the false chipper voice that Sharon despised. Just stay here until someone gets you, Sharon ordered before slamming the dungeon door shut behind her. Benny rubbed his forehead as the tall redhead wearing a skin-tight short dress paced his cluttered office. Her green eyes were calculating, which he could appreciate. That meant that she was more than just a body for a man to play with. He glared at the blank computer screen, wondering what he should do next. Benny, the choice is easy, the woman said her southern accent dripping with honey. The footage that he saw was convincing enough. Miles had just been apprehended by wolf shifters, who were determined to rescue Wanda. He wasn't sure how Madeline had been able to sneak a hidden camera into the house of the Alpha of the Wolf and Falls New Hampshire pack, but he was grateful that she managed it. But Benny wasn't sure what Madeline's motives were. She had made contact a few hours ago and revealed herself as a shifter. Benny had a few shifter friends in dark places, so hadn't been surprised by the existence of shifters. But what had thrown him was that a werewolf was interested in acquiring Wanda, the woman who knew where Cheyenne was. No, it isn't. You're asking me to allow the snitch to live? Wanda is the only person that knows where she lives. Benny pointed out. Don't you worry. After Ryan and I are done with that family, Cheyenne will only be a distant memory, Madeline said. Yes, Madeline was part of the pack that could tear Cheyenne to ribbons but what guarantee did Benny have that the pack would bother finding her? Why do you want Wanda? Benny asked. You heard the alpha female. She is determined to get her mother back. If I have Wanda, the alpha has to come to me, leaving her territory unprotected. Ryan's pack will swoop in and conquer the Wolfen Falls, New Hampshire pack. That will get us one step closer to what we want, Madeline purred. So, Wanda is being used as bait? What happens if Summer and Caden defeat you? Benny the bookie demanded. He wanted to make sure that his odds were favorable. You really think that two lovesick teenagers could defeat seasoned warriors? Madeline asked. Judging by the tightening of Madeline's smile, Benny knew that there was only one answer to Madeline's question. No, he said, his pulse racing. Then it's all settled. You'll turn Wanda over to me, Madeline said, a maniacal grin on her face. Madeline didn't say it, but he knew that an or else was hanging in the air. As long as my son stays out of prison, I'll cooperate with you, Benny said, which made Madeline grin. 
I'll do you one better, Benny. I'll ensure that Cheyenne Wilson doesn't have a chance to step foot in Florida again, the wolf said. And my men? Benny the boogie demanded. They will be unharmed unless they get in the way, Madeline declared. I can live with that, Benny said. Madeline grinned and exited Benny's office without a goodbye. Benny had no idea what Summer Wilson had gotten herself into. He was fortunate that when Cheyenne was eliminated, the police wouldn't trace it back to him. Lord knew Benny already had enough trouble on his hands. There was still the IRS to evade. It was too bad that the shifters couldn't make that problem disappear. Even if they eliminated the agent that was set to meet with him and his lawyer, the government would just send another man. Chapter 2. The Transfer Wanda opened her aching eyes when she heard the squeak of the door. Anxiety threatened to overwhelm her, but she stuffed it down, knowing that Benny the bookie wouldn't kill her. He was desperate to know the whereabouts of Cheyenne, her precious, brave daughter. It made Wanda feel guilty that part of her wished that Cheyenne could have agreed not to testify. After all, Brandon got what he deserved when Nick shot him. Wanda had the belief that if one lowered themselves by hanging with scum, they eventually became scum. But Cheyenne would never see things Wanda's way. She was going to do the right thing, no matter the consequences. Wanda loved her daughter. She really did but couldn't help but feel resentment as a figure walked toward her. Wanda, a familiar voice called. She shuddered and straightened, her back letting out a creak of discomfort. She blinked rapidly until her eyes adjusted to the light streaming into the room from the barred window. The man was average height, with a flabby stomach, ill-fitting toupee, and beady eyes. He wore a suit that was tight in the shoulders along with tacky, shiny black dress shoes. He stepped closer to Wanda, his powerful cologne mixing poorly with the stench of her unwashed body. She recognized the thick New York accent, since that man was who usually screamed orders to his men through the phone. Benny, Wanda said her voice cracking from the dryness in her throat. Benny shot Wanda a sly grin. Wanda, your two daughters have a lot in common, Benny began. She didn't bother disagreeing with the creep. Summer was soft, sweet, and a bit melodramatic. She was nothing like the bad-tempered Cheyenne, but she wasn't about to correct Benny. You see... Summer has made dangerous enemies, Wanda stiffened, unable to subdue her physical reaction. Summer? What kind of trouble did she step into in the middle of nowhere? Summer has nothing to do with this, Wanda rasped out. No, she doesn't. But her enemies have assured me that Cheyenne won't step foot in Florida. All I have to do is turn you over to them. This was a trap, a trick, a manipulation tactic. Wanda was positive that her youngest wouldn't have been able to make an enemy worse than Benny the bookie. Pete had promised to keep her safe. Pete may have been flaky during their marriage, but he loved his children. You're lying. Wanda insisted. A chill ran down Wanda's spine when Benny shot her a pitying look. You should have told me where Cheyenne was. Then, none of this would have happened, he said. You should have taught your son not to murder people. Then none of this would have happened, Wanda spat. 
The door creaked open and a woman with red hair stood in the doorway. She wore a skimpy red dress and strappy sandals. Her long acrylic nails were painted red with silver on the tips. Her green eyes were filled with what Wanda would describe as cruel hunger. Benny, it positively reeks in here. Don't you bathe your prisoners? The woman scolded. Sweat began dotting Benny's forehead, and his Adam's apple bobbed. It was obvious that this strange woman frightened him. Sorry, Madeline. I have sent Sam to pick Wanda up a change of clothes. She will shower and be released to you shortly, Benny assured. Wanda was confused, not understanding how her daughter run afoul of Madeline. This had to do with Pete and the shady contacts he made in his early years. She has ten minutes. We have business to attend to in West Virginia, she said. West Virginia? How did Summer know anyone in West Virginia? Wanda asked herself. She was cautious enough not to voice her questions. Yes, ma'am. Benny responded in a squeaky voice. Wanda debated fighting Benny on the shower, but had to admit that she smelled quite rank. I'll be outside, Madeline said before rushing away. Do whatever Madeline says, and she might keep you alive, Benny said. Wanda didn't think that Madeline looked threatening, but was wise enough not to underestimate her. No matter what you do, Cheyenne will never be found, Wanda taunted. Before Benny could reply, Sam rushed into the room with a bulging shopping bag in his grip. He eyed Wanda with disdain, probably because she need him the one time he had gotten too close. He eyed Benny with a sour expression. I don't know why we're rewarding the woman with a shower and clean clothes, he complained. Don't you worry, Sam. Wanda is about to suffer. Benny cheerfully replied. Now, lead her to the bathroom. We don't want to keep Madeline waiting. An hour later, Wanda was strapped into the seat of a luxurious private jet. The seat was buttery soft, a contrast to the chair that she had been tied to while being held by Benny, which was a plus. She had a TV attached to her seat, while behind her, there was a kitchenette and a narrow hallway that most likely led to a bathroom. Don't make me cuff you, Madeline said as she plopped onto the seat beside Wanda. In fact, stay out of the way and I just might not blow your head off. Wanda scanned Madeline's body and didn't spot a bulge, but the warning in the other woman's eyes told Wanda not to take her threat lightly. Five men dressed in black suddenly boarded the plane, their bulging muscles telling Wanda that they would be difficult to fight off. Teague, what's the status? Madeline demanded. A tall man with chocolate brown skin stepped forward. The Katrine scum are resisting, but the guys are thinking that they can hold them off until you join the fight. He replied. Wanda outwardly showed no reaction to the words that Teague spoke, but a sense of doom slithered into her stomach. Favorable. I am hoping to do very little cleanup, Madeline said in a disappointed tone. Now buckle up. It's going to be a long, boring ride. Wanda's legs nearly gave out as she was escorted out of the plane by Teague, who had a firm grip on her elbow. It was night, and the area was lighted by a light post. Her heart raced as the scent of decay smacked her in the nose. It took little time to find the source. 
not twenty feet from the plain, rested a dead lion, the poor animal's stomach torn open. Fear instantly stayed Wanda's steps, the distant sound of growling telling her that she was probably going to be introduced to the owners of the estate's exotic pets. Madeline let out a groan. The shifter's dead, Wanda. If you don't keep it moving, I'll make Teague carry you. Trust me, there will be consequences for your disobedience, Madeline threatened. Right, I can walk past the rotting carcass of a lion. Nothing to see here, Wanda told herself. She forced herself to keep walking, her body shuddering when she passed the lion. Why do shifters decay so quickly? Another man complained. There went that word again. Shifter. Was that a slang term for a lion? Wanda couldn't help but think that millennials had a strange term for everything. So she continued to walk on shaky legs away from the plane, through a field that had to be a mile, and walked to a magnificent house with a winding driveway and a security gate. Floodlights allowed her to see a mansion with columns, floor-to-ceiling windows, and what looked like balconies on the upper floors. She also noted that a couple of dead lions littered the property. Or dead shifters. Not bad, Madeline commented as the massive front door opened and a shirtless man raced out of the house. His dark hair reached his chin and his muscles were even larger than Teague's. His eyes were dark and filled with triumph. Ryan! Madeline squealed as she rushed into the shirtless man's arms. He reluctantly held her close, a tight smile appearing on his face. For a moment, Wanda hoped that she had been kidnapped by eccentric rich people who had a love for owning illegal wild animals. Maybe she could follow the rules and find a way to escape. But then a lion fell from the sky and tossed itself at Madeline. Wanda let out a startled scream, which caused Madeline to glance at the danger. Her eyes swirled with silver light and a bolt of electricity slammed against the lion, who fell to the ground not ten feet away from Wanda with a thud. Is she one of yours? Madeline demanded. Ryan grinned. Shift, Ryan demanded. Right before Wanda's eyes, what had to be a 500-pound mountain lion transformed into a woman with long black hair and brown eyes. Molly, you disappoint me, Ryan purred as he stepped forward. Hatred filled the woman's eyes as Madeline's partner walked over to her. Lionesses never follow weak wolves, the woman spat. The man tilted back his head and laughed so loudly that it nearly popped Wanda's eardrums. Blood began oozing from the woman's face which made the Alpha grin with satisfaction. Well, judging by the blood oozing from your nose, I'm not a weak wolf, Ryan said. I will never follow you. You killed my Alpha. I'd rather die than help you succeed, Molly cried, tears pouring down her face. That can be arranged, Ryan said. Wanda had hoped that Ryan was making a mere threat, but her eyes widened when his hands shifted to claws and he slit the woman's throat. Madeline let out a sigh. I'd rather not have any stinking bodies near my home, she said, before waving at the body which promptly turned to ash. Wanda's vision grew fuzzy, her legs feeling too brittle to hold her weight but she forced herself not to pass out. She couldn't, not when Ryan could possibly use his claws on her. Wanda had to stay calm so that she could observe. 
How had Summer gotten mixed up with shifters? What did this evil couple want with her? Did they know where Cheyenne was? How could Wanda possibly protect her children from monsters? Don't you worry, Wanda. I won't turn you to ash if you don't get in my way, Madeline said. Wanda let out a deep breath, then stared at the woman. Why am I here? Wanda shakily asked. Ryan smirked. Because Caden Drake wants you, your bait, he said. Wanda was going to ask who in the hell Caden Drake was when Teague spoke up. Marcy told me that there's a dungeon below. Maybe I should get Wanda down there, in case any lions decide to toss themselves at us from the roof. Teak suggested. Sounds like a plan, Madeline said. Meanwhile, it looks like we need to hunt down the more unwilling new members of our pack. If we're going to conquer the bear shifters in Alaska... We need a more united invading force. Oh, goodness. There were bear shifters? And most importantly, why in the hell did this crazy couple want to conquer them? Wanda was in no position to ask questions. Quite frankly, she was too terrified to ask questions. Instead... She didn't fight as Teague scooped her up into his arms and quickly made his way into the estate. David had been locked in the dungeon for hours, but the distant sounds of the alarm had since faded. He wasn't sure what conclusion to draw. It was either Rune was defeated and another leader was named for the Katrine Pride, or he lived. His parents had a mating bond, which meant that if Rune died, so did Sharon, unless she had the will to live without her mate. Sharon. David couldn't think of calling the woman mom, not after the hell she had put him through. Right after getting to his feet, David was shocked when the door swung open, letting in the light from the hallway. He blinked, his eyes trying to adjust to the light. Who are you? The man demanded as he entered the dungeon, a woman in his arms. David Jabber, David said, not daring to call himself a Samson. The shifter was unfamiliar, which meant that Rune had been defeated. And why are you here? He demanded. Bad luck, David quipped. To David's surprise, the man chuckled. I'll ask Madeline what to do with you. In the meantime, keep Wanda company. The man instructed before placing the woman on the floor and exiting the dungeon. As soon as the door slammed shut, a realization hit David. His mother was probably dead. Chapter 3 Controlling Assets Empress Annabelle Wolfen of the Wolfen Empire was reduced to hiding on her territory because of some stupid, self-righteous nutcase who thought that he could do better than her. After barely running Wolfen Falls, North Carolina, Ryan Braxstone was somehow delusional enough to believe that he could manage an entire empire. That's why she currently sat at the head of the dining room table in the main house, waiting for the other members of her council to arrive. She glanced down at the pristine white tablecloth that was laden with the best crystal and china that the Empire had to offer, and felt a migraine coming on. Annabelle instinctively glared at the portrait that covered most of the wall beside the floor to ceiling window. It was of Bethro Wolfen, the man that conquered all known wolf packs and brought them into his empire. Annabelle wished that she could travel back in time and dropkick the man for establishing the empire. My love, William, 
her consort said as he entered the room, followed by her second-in-command, Felix, and his vapid wife, Paula. Most of the time, Annabelle loved the other woman's company, but in a time of war, she couldn't possibly understand what she could add to this discussion. Dylan, the head of security, entered last, followed by Mary, his homely mate. Annabelle waited for the group to be seated before she spoke. Ryan has attempted to conquer Wolfen Falls, West Virginia, Annabelle said. To her annoyance, Paula had the nerve to arch a brow. Attempted? I thought that Ryan killed the Alpha, she pointed out. Felix shot his holder a warning glance before Annabelle could use an Alpha command on her. His Beta survived. I have ordered three alphas to aid him in reclaiming his territory. Annabelle impatiently explained before moving on. It's a suitable solution for now, but what we need is to put together a strike team to take out Braxstone. He's too dominant for anyone to take on. Mary unhelpfully interjected as she shot Dylan a fearful glance. She was probably worried that Annabelle would send her holder into danger. Who would be on that team? Felix asked. Kid and Drake and his holder are some of the people I wish to recruit. They are strong enough to withstand Braxstone's alpha commands. I need to test the theory, but his twin Camille should also have that trait, Annabelle suggested. Everyone aside from Felix wore identical expressions of confusion. Caden Drake? Are you talking about the teenager that could influence Alpha commands? Paula asked, her face pinching up in disgust. He's more dominant than you are. My vote is for you to eliminate him. Annabelle wasn't the sort to delude herself. She knew that Paula spoke truth. She just didn't want to face the fact that she might have to kill one of her alphas if he grew too powerful. Annabelle, how will we be certain that Caden Drake would even bother eliminating Ryan Brackstone? Dylan wondered. Valid question. Despite Madeline attempting to assassinate his own mother, Caden was still reluctant to fight other alphas. Annabelle could sense the waves of annoyance coming from Caden during their meetings. Nicole told me that Caden is unhappy about the raised taxes. Maybe you should promise him that if he aids the Empire, he will be rewarded by receiving a tax reduction, Dylan offered. Or you could just order him to help, Felix cut in. Despite the fact that Caden is more dominant than Annabelle, she is still his empress. He shall serve with honor. Paula nodded in agreement, but William shook his head. I wouldn't recommend using bribery. Every time we need Caden, the price will keep on getting higher. One day, he'll ask for our empire, William argued. We should act with caution. With caution? Paula shrieked. If this were any other time, Caden would either be imprisoned or dead. Annabelle, you missed out on getting rid of him. He was vulnerable, driven by the need to bite his soulmate. You could have killed the boy, Paula insisted. He needs to be the one that defeats Bragstone. And in order for him to do that, he will need proper training, Annabelle slowly said, an idea sparking in her mind. Training, Paula cried. You want to train your enemy? Annabelle knew that Cade had no desire to rule. He was content to live in a small town with his holder. But unless Paula had a soul-deep connection with the Alpha, she would never understand what motivated the Alpha. Felix, you will take the private jet to Wolfen Falls, New Hampshire to train Caden. 
will let Ryan believe that he has conquered Wolfen Falls, West Virginia. Once Caden is deemed ready, you will send him to take out Ryan Braxstone. Paula's mouth dropped open. That could take months. You expect me to spend that time without my holder? She complained. Of course not. You're going with him. I believe that you are more than adequate to train Summer, Paula, Annabelle declared. So, you want me to train the person that could possibly overthrow me? Paula screamed. Annabelle was tempted to snap Paula's neck, but she calmed herself. Despite his stuffy nature, Felix was actually an excellent trainer. What are you two waiting for? Go train your charges. Make sure that they are safe and near you at all times, Annabelle said, her command strong. Felix and Paula abruptly left the room, and Dylan let out a sigh. Empress, we need more than just Felix and Paula keeping an eye on the Alpha pair. Should Mary and I go as well? Dylan inquired. Before Annabelle could contemplate Dylan's question, she felt a blast of heat flare in her body, which meant that one of her alphas was claiming a pack member. The heat continued to rise in temperature, as if this alpha was giving blood to dozens of shifters at once. Annabelle closed her eyes and concentrated on the threads. She discovered the alpha easily enough. Ryan Bragstone. But the threats of the people that he was claiming were the wrong color. The thread of a wolf was a bright white. But these threads were silver. Silver, like. Ryan has just conquered a pride, Annabelle calmly announced. But there is only one pride in America, the assassins. Dylan replied. Exactly, Annabelle said, bitter realization filling her soul. Ryan was probably going to control the felines in order for it to be easier for him to eliminate the alphas of her packs. That meant that all of her alphas were in danger. I need to speak to Caden Drake, Annabelle said before picking up the cell phone that was hidden on her lap. She quickly called Caden, who answered on the third ring. Empress? He asked. His tone was tense, as if he was in the middle of a stressful situation. You are not to leave your territory, not for any reason. Ryan Braxstone has successfully conquered Wolfen Falls, West Virginia. Since you are the only official alpha, you must be on your territory at all times, Annabelle ordered. That won't work, Caden said. I'm preparing for a mission. This isn't a suggestion, Caden. It's an order. Annabelle sent her will into their bond, and Caden let out a groan. Of course it is, he muttered. Is there anything else? Annabelle debated telling Caden about Felix and Paula's arrivals, but thought better of it. She wanted her people to get an accurate view on how the young Alpha ran things. Maybe you should send your second-in-command on the mission. He is very efficient, she offered. I need him here, Caden admitted. We have a sudden influx of new members which means more taxes. I hope you understand, Caden. It's expensive to fund a war, Annabelle gently said. You could just kill Braxstone and be done with it, Caden suggested. Oh, believe me, Caden. I have a plan for Braxstone. You'll just have to be patient, she said. Is there anything else? Caden demanded. No. I'll let you know when I have more orders, Annabelle said, before hanging up the phone. Paula glared at her maid, 
an unmated submissive wolf. Her arms were crossed in defiance, which couldn't do. No, Paula was no alpha, but she was dominant enough to assert her own will. Kelsey, pack my bags, Paula slowly enunciated. The woman pushed her black hair away from her slender neck, revealing a bite mark. I found my holder. You know the rules, Paula. If your maid is mated, then you can't force them to work for you. Kelsey gestured to the mountain of clothes that rested on Paula's king-size bed. You'll have to figure out how to pack all of that into two suitcases, she said with amusement. As Kelsey stepped away from the bed, Paula attempted to reach for her, but her body wouldn't obey. For a moment, confusion filled Paula, until she remembered that Annabelle had commanded her never to prevent a mated maid from leaving her employ. Bye. I hope you die a miserable death someday, you cruel witch, Kelsey sneered before storming out of the room, slamming the door behind her. Moments later, Felix exited the bathroom, dressed in a pair of jeans and a cable knit sweater. Annabelle is going to pay for this, Paula hissed, as she reluctantly grabbed one of her suitcases out of her walk-in closet. No, she won't, and we both know it. Felix said, which just annoyed Paula even more. Chapter Four, The Night Before I pushed the plate away from me, my stomach sated. It had been a struggle to force the food down, but my body needed the nourishment. It had only been my first official day as a wolf, and problems had stacked up. The list was so daunting that keeping track of it all was starting to put me in a panic. First off, Benny the bookie kidnapped my mother in an attempt to locate my sister, the only witness to a murder. Some of Benny the bookie's goons had actually dared to attempt to kidnap me. Those men were currently sitting in my holder's living room, being interrogated by my boyfriend, soulmate, and Alpha. To make matters more complicated, my father's dead fiancé son Larry was in the guest room going through the turn. Why? Well, that was because my packmate Roxanne discovered that he was her holder, who is dying from an illness. Oh yeah, let's not forget that a war was brewing. Some power-hungry alpha was trying to take over the Wolfen Empire. How anyone could breathe under so much pressure was beyond me. Hey, baby, Cade said as he walked into the room. The exhaustion in his eyes concerned me. I stood and went to him, my arms wrapping around him. His arms were warm and I felt like I was home. My wolf urged me to claim him so that our bond could be secure. But my wolf was nuts. After I found a way to save my mother, I would worry about marriage. What have you decided? I asked as he began rubbing my back. That you and two trusted packmates need to go save your mother, he figured. I don't want to let you go since you haven't shifted yet. But if you shift now, you'll be too tired to go. Who are you sending with me? I asked. Kate's arms momentarily tightened. He obviously didn't want to let me go, but knew that I had to save my mother. Zack and Camille, I would go with you, but our dear Empress just ordered me to stay on our territory. You have to go so that your wolf will guide you to your mother. If those men lie. But you don't want me to go, I figured. Kate let out a sigh. As much as I want to beg you to stay, I can't ask that of you. 
you can't leave your mother in his hands, he reluctantly said. Do we have a plan for how to use Benny the bookie's thugs? I asked, eager to save my mother. Miles, the guy that attacked Jeannie, will tell the boss that he ran into trouble, but he was able to kidnap you. Then, you and company will fly to Florida. Benny the bookie is hiding out in a small town an hour away from Orlando. Your wolf will guide you to your mother, he said. Then what? I asked, suddenly nervous. I don't know. All of this depends on the situation. Camille and Zach will assess the situation. He responded. Okay, I said. How are you paying for the private jet? That was your father's idea. He already chartered it, Cade replied. You leave tomorrow morning. So I'm expected to sleep tonight? I ask in a shaky tone. You need to sleep, baby. I need you to go into that situation with a clear head, he insisted. My fingers ran through his hair, my instincts craving a taste of his mouth. But I knew what my wolf really wanted. And on some level, I wanted it as well. A deep connection with Cade would feel wonderful. I couldn't lie to myself. My body was yearning for his. Summer, what are you thinking? Yeah, right. I couldn't tell Cade about what was on my mind. What if someone overheard? What if my father overheard? I only sensed Blake in the living room with the three monsters that had attempted to kidnap me. My father was upstairs, sitting by Larry's bedside. Since the money grubber had been sick before Roxanne bit him, the turn was going to take a long time. I was thinking about claiming you, I softly admitted. The dead silence wasn't exactly a confidence booster. I peered up at Cade and realized that his eyes were filled with desire. Well, if he continued to look at me like that, resisting him would be difficult. What about it? This husky question gave me butterflies. I wanted to know when it would happen, I said my eyes boring into his. Caden gave me a soft smile that showed his fondness for me. I really want to claim you, Summer. I. Caden shook his head, and it took a few seconds for me to figure out why. Footsteps were coming toward us. Despite that fact, I still held him. Cade was my holder, and I wasn't releasing him for a second especially since we'd be apart soon. Kiddo, Larry's turning is going to take a while. My father said as he entered the kitchen. It had been a couple of hours since I last spoken to him. I reluctantly pulled away from Kay to face him. He actually scowled at my holder. I always find you in Kate's arms. He's my holder. When you find yours, you'll understand, I argued, my instincts pushing me to defend our relationship. Moments later, I regretted my words when sadness flashed in my father's eyes. That may be the case, but you're still my little girl, he reminded me. Fair enough. Thanks for chartering the private jet, I said, giving my father a smile. Wanda was my wife once. I don't want to see her hurt. As I was saying, Larry's turning will be a while. I want to be there for him. I don't feel comfortable with you being alone. I was thinking I would be okay with you staying here, provided that Caden's door stays open at all times. He said, excitement at the thought of a sleepover nearly caused me to dance for joy.
that can be done. But your daughter and I no longer have to go on those dreaded group dates. You know that I can be trusted. Kate firmly responded. I knew that something was up with you. Fine. You aren't a drug dealer, but you're still a wolf. Your sister did save my life, so I suppose that you wolves aren't that bad. My father grudgingly admitted. And sure, you can take summer on dates. But like I said, none of this crazy moving in together crap. Dad, I'm going to be the female alpha of this pack. Kate and I are holders. We're going to move in together at some point, I argued. My exhausted father rubbed his eyes. Take it one day at a time, kiddo. Just remember, you'll have to explain all of this to your mother after you rescue her. My father warned before leaving the room. I glanced at Caden, who had an amused look on his face. At least we can go on dates by ourselves, he said before pressing a kiss to my cheek. When I get back, you better take me to the fisherman, I said, which made my boyfriend chuckle. I will also guide you through your first shift, take you for long walks, watch movies with you, and... A thump from the living room caused my boyfriend to curse. We both ran into the room, our eyes landing on one of Benny the Bookie's goons. He stood, his hands free of bonds. The thud came from someone slipping through the window. Since I was the closest to the doorway, I sped out of the house, my canines elongating. Miles, the smallest of the three, insulted us by trying to get away. I felt the presence of a pack member running up ahead, although my connection was too new, so I couldn't identify the member but my eyes adjusted to the dark as I sprang down the street. Miles was tackled to the ground by Zach Anderson, the guy who had kept me company during homecoming. I grinned as Zach pinned the man. Thanks, Zach, I said, not even winded. Zach glanced up and shot me a wide grin. No problem. It looks like this one has to be locked up, he noted. Let me up, Miles squeaked. Not after what you did to my friend, I said, the anger making my hands morph into claws. Zack whistled. If you don't shut up, my alpha female might just slit your throat, he warned. She wouldn't do that. She needs me to find her mother, Miles said, his heart rate increasing. I heard footsteps behind me and spun around. Lisa was standing there, a bored expression on her face. Her wolf was probably annoyed that she had to deal with Miles. Zack, knock him out. We need to secure him. Lisa huffed. If I don't call Benny back in half an hour, he'll think that I failed. He will move your mother or kill her. Please, Summer, I need my phone. Miles begged. Will a text message do? I asked after considering for a moment. No, he'll need me to check in, Miles pleaded. Why would you care if my mother is killed or not? I challenged, not believing this weasel for a second. I'm not a killer. I noticed that Jeannie's wounds were healing. You got to believe me. I'm the security guy, the cameraman, the lackey. Benny is running out of assistance because Cheyenne's information caused a lot of them to take plea deals. It's only a matter of time before Benny gets implicated in Brandon's murder, Miles said, which sort of sounded true. But my instincts told me not to trust this man for a moment. We only need one of them, Zack told me, his eyes hard. True, but this one has been more helpful, I decided, feeling queasy about killing someone in cold blood. 
My instincts told me to kill when necessary. Miles was subdued, so I didn't need to rip his throat out. Let's not spend any more time on him, Lisa said. I felt something bubble in my stomach. Moments later, the sound of snoring filled the air. Zach stood and shot an expression at Caden's mother. Nice. You made him fall asleep? Zach asked, impressed. I manipulated a few chemicals in his body, Lisa said, shooting us a soft expression. I wish I were a mage, Zach wistfully said. No, you don't, Zach. Believe me, Lisa said before walking back into the house. That probably took a lot out of her, Zach speculated as he hefted Miles over his shoulder. I still had so much to learn. Caden had told me that someone was considered a mage when they could manipulate energy. It sounded like a cool gift. But Ryan Braxstone was targeting mages. So maybe it was a good thing that I wasn't a mage. Feeling annoyed by Miles' episode, I made my way back into the house. Lisa thankfully zapped our other two prisoners so that everyone could get some sleep. Caden's room was a tantalizing mix of safety and comfort. His scent was everywhere. I eyed the king-size bed with its tucked-in sheets and smiled. You make your bed? I asked, never seeing the point. Why make a bed when you are only going to sleep in it later? Every morning, Kate said, as he wrapped his arms around me from behind. Nervous? Nervous that I'll never want to leave, I bluntly told him. Kate chuckled and kissed the top of my head. Come on, baby. Let's get to bed. He led me to his king-size bed and I slipped under his black sheets. Kate joined me and I turned so that my face was resting on his chest. It didn't take long for me to fall asleep. Chapter 5. The Send-Off A shake to the shoulder made my eyes pop open. The bed was so comfortable that I didn't want to move. My father stood beside the bed, his serious expression causing urgency to fill me. Where's Cade? I demanded, my heart rate spiking. I woke you up at the last possible second. You have five minutes to brush your teeth and get dressed. My father said, gesturing to a folded outfit on Cade's desk. Thanks, I said, before forcing myself to get out of bed. My father exited and gently closed the door behind him. I was about to go on a mission to save my mother. I hoped that I was successful. It felt wrong for me to attempt to take down a bookie without Cade. But Annabelle's orders were clear. Cade was not permitted to leave his territory. I changed into a short-sleeved t-shirt, sweatpants, and Converse chucks. If I didn't know that Jolene was currently at Todd's house, I would have assumed that she had chosen this outfit. I found Cade in the kitchen, standing beside Camille. As soon as our eyes met, my heart ached. Last night had been wonderful. Being in his arms was like sleeping on clouds. I cared for the Alpha and didn't want to leave him. But my mother needed me, so I had to woman up. Hey, baby, you're awake, he said, shooting me an amused grin. Best sleep ever, I declared. Don't get used to it. My father called from the living room. A flash of annoyance nearly forced me to storm into the living room to remind him that I was his alpha. My wolf was offended. Who was he to tell me what to do? 
But I tamped the instinct down, reminding myself that he was my father. Zack is outside with Miles and his goons, Kate said. Glad I didn't have to get them in order, I commented. I had mom pack you guys sandwiches to eat on the way, Kate told me. Thank you, I said, my heart feeling like it was going to shatter. I didn't want to leave Caden. His calming scent filled my nose, soothing the tightness in my chest. He rubbed my back, me hating my clothes for serving as a barrier. I wanted him to be touching my bare skin. Cade was mine, and more than ever, my instincts were telling me to claim him. Yet again, I ignored my wolf instincts and focused on my human needs. I rose on my tiptoes and brushed a kiss to his lips, keeping it PG since my father was in the next room. Be safe, Summer, he gently told me. You too, I said, before pulling away. You're the one going on a mission, he argued. Just be safe, Caden. Don't let anything happen to yourself, I said, accepting that it was time to pull myself from his embrace. The pack minivan was parked in front of the house, Zack and Camille were standing guard, their features turning into welcoming smiles. They were pack. I wouldn't be alone on this mission. The sight of them gave me more confidence. They'd help me hurry back to Caden. My father joined us outside, his face expressing concern. Take care, kid. He told me before wrapping his arms around me. I held my father tightly, my protective instincts not wanting him to wander far from this house, since I wasn't there to protect him. I love you, I told him. I love you too, kid. Bring your mother home, he encouraged. We will, I said with confidence. Cade walked me to the van and kissed me on the cheek. Then I hopped into the seat behind the driver, which would be Camille. Miles was seated beside me, his bruised face not garnering any sympathy from me. He was the idiot who had tried to run from wolves. After I buckled up, Camille and Zack entered the van, and my future sister-in-law drove me away from my holder. You know... My appearance will draw attention, Miles warned. As soon as we get to the airport, I will shout for help. You can't shift then. We aren't going to the airport, Camille announced. We have an airstrip in town. Miles's defeated look filled me with satisfaction. He deserved to feel panic. What about the pilot flying you? He'll wonder about our wounds. Miles said, which stumped me. Doubt it. Our pilot is a dragon shifter. He won't care about useless humans, Camille taunted. Dragon shifters? I asked, stunned. You can't be serious. Yep. I haven't met this shifter before, but most dragons tend to own businesses. They love money. Camille bluntly explained. What if I reveal the existence of shifters? Miles threatened. Then we'd either have to kill you or turn you. Camille figured, which made Miles shudder. Thankfully, after that threat, Miles was blissfully quiet. It took 15 minutes to arrive at the airstrip. A private jet was waiting for us on the tarmac. A tall man with golden brown hair, blue eyes, and a light dusting of facial hair was waiting for us. Camille exited the van first and approached him. Moments later, a second man exited the plane. 
This one, seven feet tall with muscles that were intimidating to Miles. The giant opened my door and smiled down at me. Camille tells me that we have some difficult human cargo, the guy said. I have to ask, are they human slaves? No, they work for a man that is holding my mother hostage, I responded. The dragon shifter scowled. Why are they holding your mother hostage? He demanded. I told the man of my sister and her witnessing a murder. The man glanced at me with a thoughtful expression. What do you plan to do to the men that have your mother? He wondered. I don't know. I hoped to knock them out, grab my mother, and fly back home. I said. Miles laughed. After that insult... Then he will just send more men back here, Miles pointed out. I rubbed my forehead, feeling a headache coming on. Of course, Miles was right. Benny the bookie would continue being a problem. Let's talk on the plane, the dragon shifter suggested. I nodded and exited the car. Zack coaxed the two burly thugs onto the plane while Miles reluctantly walked in front of me. I sat beside Miles, thinking that I could keep an eye on him. The plane had five rows of seats on either side of the aisle. The blonde man, who was named Sal, was the pilot, and the muscular man, named Andy, was his co-pilot. I respected Andy for ensuring that we weren't enslaving humans. His question made me think well of the two businessmen. I forced myself to relax as the plane took off. This is a bad idea, Miles said, which woke me up from my nap. I bolted upright, the seatbelt stopping my momentum. I blinked, then realized that I was on the private jet that my father had chartered. Do you ever shut up? Camille asked from her seat across from me. She was seated beside one of the less abused goons. I'm trying to help here, Miles said. Your plan isn't going to work. I don't care what you think, I snapped, my agitation rising. I had been dreaming of being in Caden's arms before this idiot had woken me up. And now that I was awake, the ache of missing him was about to cause tears to spring in my eyes. All I wanted was to pull him into my arms, but I couldn't, because this stupid man decided to be a thorn in my side. Maybe you should call Cade after the plane lands, Camille suggested. It would have been nice to hear my holder's voice. But then, something else occurred to me. We need to grab my mother and leave as soon as possible. I don't want to spend any more time away from Cade than I have to. Camille nodded in understanding. You think that our boss is going to give up Wanda so easily? He's got her with one of our more sociopathic associates. Said Mitch the man who was being guarded by Camille. I hope you're willing to kill for your mother. I don't have a problem killing, Camille said, her dark eyes hard. Yeah, you do. I know for a fact that you don't need us alive for this mission. Miles is enough, he argued. I said that I don't have a problem with killing. It doesn't mean that I'll kill needlessly. I'm above that. Camille snapped. I don't get your point, Mitch. Zack cut in. Do you want us to kill one of you? I'd like to know where I stand, Mitch said. Are you guys going to kill me once you find Wanda? Not if you don't get in the way of us taking her. I replied, uncomfortable with the thought of killing someone. You know I can't promise that. If the boss tells me that I have to attack, I will. 
Mitch said. Why? I asked, curious. Because I don't have a choice, Mitch admitted. I'm a felon who didn't graduate high school. Benny pays good money. I have a family to support. I wished that I could give him options. Camille rolled her eyes. There's always a choice. Who in the hell told you to commit a felony? She challenged. My daughter needed medicine that I couldn't afford. I broke into a drugstore, held someone at gunpoint while another worker filed the order for me, he argued. Camille wasn't moved, though I did see where Mitch was coming from. If I had to break the law to save someone I loved, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I robbed a bank, said Carlton from his seat beside Zach. I was tired of being poor. So you were greedy? I asked, not feeling bad for the other man. Easy for you to say. Look at you, Summer. You're riding in a private jet. You have parents that are able to provide for you. Where I was stuck working a dead-end job. The other man snapped. Miles rolled his eyes. Carlton, if you're trying to get Summer to relate to you, it won't work, Miles warned. What's your story, Miles? I hotly asked. I do what I have to, Miles snapped. So torturing my friend was you doing what you have to do? I asked, disgust in my voice. The same way you tortured us, Miles accused. Oh, please. I think what we did was more intimidation than torture, Camille argued. Keep telling yourself that, Camille. Miles taunted. I could gag you, Camille threatened. You've been annoying during this flight. We are going to land in ten minutes, Sal announced over the speaker. Hearing those words filled me with nerves. Would I be able to find my mother? Would I have to kill anyone? Would mom accept the choices I made? I couldn't imagine her being angry with me. After all, I'd be the one saving her. But I knew that people sometimes feared what they didn't understand. No matter how she felt, I was going to be strong enough to get her to safety. We'd figure everything else out later. Chapter 6 Surprises Caden stood on the front lawn of his home, questioning the wisdom of his choice. The Empress's alpha commands were like suggestions to his wolf. He could have pretended to obey, then do as he pleased. But there was something in Annabelle's voice that told him that leaving his territory unprotected would have severe consequences. But what of his holder? Summer was his light, his heart, the other half of his soul. And she was so far away. Why are you standing out here? Roxanne asked, her voice startling him. Cade forced down the urge to growl, angry that someone caught him by surprise. He turned to see the woman whose skin was pale. Her green eyes had prominent shadows under them, and her red hair was greasy. He took a whiff of the she-wolf and couldn't help but wrinkle his nose. I'm surprised that you're out of bed, Kate commented. Roxanne lifted her chin as her shoulders squared. I get that I should have asked you before turning Larry, but he was dying, Kate. I'm surprised that you hadn't noticed that before. Roxanne's accusing tone annoyed Kate to no end, so he spoke without thinking. I didn't care to notice. The only time I had the displeasure of dealing with Larry, he was nagging my mate about some inheritance he had no right to, Cade replied. The disappointed expression on Roxanne's face made him feel a bit guilty. 
No one wanted to think that their holder was nothing more than a greedy bastard. There has to be more to the story, Roxanne insisted, as if his opinion of Larry really mattered. It's not me that has to spend the rest of my life with him, Kate said as Blake joined them. Kaden, what should we? Blake blinked in confusion when a Lincoln Navigator pulled into the driveway. Cade would have dismissed the car's occupants as lost humans if it weren't for the shifter vibes that emanated from the vehicle. Dread filled Roxanne's face as she glanced between her Alpha and Beta. You're punishing me for biting Larry? Roxanne asked. No, why? Kate snapped, not looking forward to dealing with strange shifters. Because... That's the car of Empress Annabelle II, Roxanne pointed out. Cade was tempted to shift when Felix exited the driver's side, followed by his holder. They both looked as if they had been sucking on something sour for weeks. The couple were dressed in matching designer jeans and sweaters, probably to combat the chill in the air. Blake let out a snort which earned a disapproving glance from Roxanne. I did not invite them here, Kate said, not caring that the beta pair were in hearing distance. Felix scowled as the couple approached. Caden, Felix said in a stiff tone. The Empress has ordered for me to continue your training. Kate let out a growl, furious by the surprise. And my holder, Paula, is to train your holder, Summer. Where is she? Felix scanned the area, as if searching for the strong alpha female that was supposed to be by Caden's side. She's on a mission, Kate replied, annoyed by the intrusion. Mission where? Paula demanded. I must join her. Unless you can fly to Florida, that won't be happening. The Alpha replied. Felix glanced at Paula, whose blue eyes momentarily filled with sadness, which was confusing. The Empress ordered me to keep an eye on Summer. I can't do that from here, Paula declared. Moments later, Felix handed his holder the keys to the car. Let me grab my luggage so that you can catch up with her, he said. Luggage? Kate asked. Where are you staying? With you. Empress's orders. Felix responded. Cade wanted to screw decorum and command Felix to go back to Florida. But he held off after recognizing the opportunity that had just been presented to him. Paula was an experienced fighter who was centuries old. If she were truly sent to his territory to keep his holders safe, Giving her the details of the mission could only help Summer's odds. But Caden was never a betting man. He refused to take any chances with his holder's safety. He eyed Paula before speaking. Were you sent here to kill Summer? Answer me honestly, he commanded. No, I was ordered to train her, Paula responded. But why? The question was on the tip of Kate's tongue when Felix spoke. The longer you delay my holder, the longer it takes for Summer to receive assistance, Felix insisted. Kate shot Felix a glare before briefing the Alpha pair on the situation. How in the hell does Summer plan on retrieving her mother without shifting? Unless she plans on killing Benny the Bookie and his friends, Paula said. The goal is to sneak Wanda out of the safe house, Kate explained. Paula let out a huff and wrapped her arms around her holder. After pressing a soft kiss to his lips, Paula pulled away and shot Kate an expectant look. Kate stood there, not knowing what the she-wolf wanted. Aren't you going to help us with our luggage? Since I'm going on a mission, I can hardly take everything, she pointed out. 
Cade reluctantly followed Paula and Felix to the back of the navigator. The trunk was popped open, and the luggage was distributed amongst all of the wolves, except for Paula, who snatched up an overnight bag and sat in the driver's seat. The trunk had barely been closed when the engine turned on. Felix, Cade, Blake, and Roxanne lugged the heavy suitcases into the pack house and up the staircase. Cade led Felix to the only empty guest room, which happened to be beside his, and dumped his burden in front of the king-size bed. I actually have pack business to attend to, Caden said, his mind drifting to Roxanne's holder. He was positive that Larry wasn't going to be thrilled about his turning. If he made a fuss, Roxanne would have to be punished. Larry slowly opened his gritty eyes, not surprised when his wakefulness was greeted by a pounding headache. The tumor was only getting worse. He could feel it in how his limbs ached and his stomach twisted. He blinked until his vision cleared. The first thing that Larry took notice of was the unfamiliar ceiling, which was complete with a skylight. Did I faint? Larry asked himself. The last thing Larry remembered was speaking to Summer on her porch. The gold-digging brat was about to toss herself in harm's way to save one of her friends. He had to admit that maybe Summer was more selfless than he had given her credit for. If that were the case, why would she hang on to money that wasn't hers? Larry was desperate to get his hands on more money in hopes that he could move to Europe to undergo an experimental procedure. He was desperate to save his life. Since his money was tied up with that stupid house he was having trouble selling, Summer and Pete were his only source of money. You're awake, Pete said as he entered the room, bringing in the heavy scent of Axe Cologne. Did you bathe with your cologne? Larry complained, his mouth filling with acid. You get used to it, Pete said, his voice sounding too loud in Larry's ears. Why are you talking so loudly, Pete? Larry demanded, his head pounding even harder. A sympathetic expression appeared on Pete's face. You look green, Larry. Are you feeling all right? Pete asked. Of course, I'm sick, you moron. I fainted. Larry responded. Pete ran his fingers through his dark hair as his tired eyes bounced around the room. You were sick and never told me, Pete said. Were? I'm still sick, and I want nothing to do with you, Pete. You broke up my parents' marriage, then got my mother murdered, Larry accused. Pete shook his head. I didn't get your mother murdered. In fact, I want to find her murderer as much as you do, Pete said. But Larry knew that he was speaking a load of crap. Really? So you aren't enjoying her money? Larry taunted. I'd rather have Sharon alive, Pete said. The money means nothing. I've barely touched it. Then why won't you give me your share? You could. Summer's boyfriend marched into the room, a scowl on his face. He was followed by a nervous-looking redhead. Larry didn't blame her, since it was nerve-wracking when someone fainted out of nowhere. Did you tell him yet? The redhead asked, her voice shaking. Tell me what? Larry demanded. I didn't get that far, Pete said, annoyance flashing across his face. What are you people talking about? Larry shouted. You're a werewolf. Roxanne turned you because you're her holder, which means that you're her soulmate. 
Kate said. Larry was officially irritated. He got out of bed and charged Cade, his intention to shake Cade for his prank. He had just reached Cade when he felt a sharp pain go through his hands. Frowning, Larry glanced down at his hands and discovered that they were now paws covered in dark brown fur. Before he could panic, the redhead stepped forward and wrapped her hand around his bicep. Don't, she pleaded. Cade is our alpha. You can't attack him. Desire slammed into Larry. His only need to make the woman currently hanging on to him his. His gums tingled and he felt the prick of fangs on his tongue. That broke the spell. He jerked away from the woman his body rebelling against the separation. Relax, Kate said, a wave of power crashing into Larry's chest, halting his movements. You're too weak to attempt your shift. Wolf? Larry asked. I'm a wolf? It was either turn you or let you die, the redhead explained. You didn't think of asking me first? Larry challenged anger filling his gut. You were so close to death, I had to save you, the redhead, who Larry presumed was Roxanne, said. But I have free will. I have the right to choose. How could you? Larry said as a tall, thin man joined the party. He looked to be the snooty business type that Larry was used to dealing with. I don't mean to interrupt this riveting conversation, but something isn't right, the stranger said. No kidding, Sherlock. I'm a freaking wolf. A wolf. And this woman didn't think to ask me if I wanted to be, Larry shouted. Instinct drove Larry to spin around, just as a man wearing a dark cloak rushed out of the closet, holding a gun. Chapter 7 The Arrival We landed on a private airstrip that the dragons owned. Then, a dragon named Keith pulled up in a stretch limo that we promptly piled into. He drove us to a sleepy town an hour away from Orlando. Miles reluctantly gave directions to where my mother was being held. Keith parked two blocks from the house. I'll wait here for you guys, he insisted. Summer, can you sense your mom? Zack asked. I had no idea how to sense my mother. It frustrated me that Cade hadn't had much time to train me on how to track. He told me that this would come naturally to me. I closed my eyes and tapped into my wolf. I concentrated on the face of my mother. Thinking of her made my heart ache. I felt the urge to step out of the limo. I allowed my instincts to take over and exited the limo without a word, Camille following behind me. Keith and Zack would keep an eye on the other men. I ran down the empty sidewalk at super speed. At this rate, my only goal was reaching my mom. Human witnesses be damned. I had just turned into the driveway of a house when my wolf sent me a warning. I had a glimpse of a leaping animal before I tossed myself to the pavement and rolled away. I got back to my feet in time to see that another creature had attempted to attack Camille. I sniffed the air, not recognizing any of the scents. These were wolves. The one that had leapt at me was reddish-brown with a white nose. The one that tried to get the drop on Camille was all black. I was so annoyed by the attack that the power just surged out of me. Shift, I practically growled. Moments later, a petite woman with ebony skin and a short black bob 
and a tall man with raven-colored hair and honey-brown skin were facing me. Both of them seemed surprised that I had been able to order them to shift. I wasn't sure why, since neither of them were as dominant as I was. Ryan sent you, I accused, my nose picking up a scent. I inhaled deeply and didn't recognize it. It smelled like wires, plastic, and... Oh, hell. Camille, do you smell that? The woman seemed perplexed by my words. Smell what? Camille asked. I forced my hearing to expand and didn't detect any heartbeats in the house. Cold dread nearly drowned me. Have you hurt my mother? I demanded, power still coating my voice. No, we arrived two minutes before you did. She was gone by then. The man who had a southern accent responded. His partner glared at him. Take a nap, I ordered, having a feeling that time was of the essence. The shifters dropped to the ground and began sleeping. Camille shook her head, disbelief on her face. I think that the napping couples are alphas, and you just commanded them, Camille pointed out. I couldn't care less about what I managed to do. Something didn't seem right. I racked my brain. But what was it? Yes, I smelled the horrid wire smell, sweat, cigarettes, and... A pop filled the air, and I let out a scream as pain exploded in my upper arm. The roof! Camille screamed as blood oozed down my arm. The scent of my blood, which was mingled with something acidic, was filling my nostrils. My body grew heavy as I attempted to move. We were sitting ducks out in the open without an obstacle to block the sniper's view of us. Poison, Camille hissed as she yanked on my arm. They poisoned you. Without warning, my holder's twin tossed me over her shoulder and ran. My wound was at times jolted by her footsteps. Pain filled every fiber of my being. It even hurt to draw breath, which felt like gurgling glass. What happened? Keith screamed. Ambush, Camille yelled. Summer was shot with a poisoned bullet. Put her down, Keith instructed. By then, my vision was blurry. All I knew was the pain that was torturing my body. I groaned as my sensitive skin made contact with the concrete. We have to get out of here, Camille insisted. That assassin could have followed me. Doubt it, Keith said. It was obvious that the target was your alpha. The door to the limo opened, and I could sense Zack coming toward me. I have the first aid kit. What do I need to do? Zack asked. You need to pull out the bullet. Her blood smells like it has been poisoned. Keith replied. I'll cover you, Zack. Camille offered. Before anyone could move, the screeching of tires sounded in the distance. A car drew nearer, which told me that humans were probably going to stumble upon us. That was perfect. What in the hell were we going to tell them? The slamming of the car door was followed by the thump of footsteps. An unfamiliar scent wafted in my nose. It didn't smell human. Were we in someone's territory? I was in too much pain to think critically. Camille? Drake? What in the hell are you doing in the middle of the road? A female demanded. I wasn't surprised when Keith was the one that responded. Lady Paula, your subject was shot by a poisoned bullet. The dragon shifter explained. Of course. Paula muttered before I felt a tugging sensation in my arm. Something slid out of the bullet hole, and the pain dramatically receded. 
In a few moments, I slowly sat up, the fuzziness in my head slowly clearing. We need to find my mother, I said to the group standing around me. How do you suppose we do that? Paula, the strange wolf that had stopped to help us, demanded. I took a look at her, trying to determine how to play this angle. Look, Paula, thanks for helping me, I said, my voice raspy. But we're on a mission to, to save your mother from a bookie. Spare me the details, Caden told me already. My point is that you were shot with a bullet dripped in wolfsbane. So that means that you'll be weak for a while. We need to hunker down until you're strong enough, Paula reasoned. Cade sent you? I asked, trying to make sense of the situation. No, the Empress sent me to train you, Paula corrected. The Empress? Why was she invested in ensuring that I properly learned how to use my powers? We had only spoken on the phone briefly when Caden lost his crap after I had nearly been attacked. It wasn't like we had a sit-down conversation. Could I trust this woman? My lady, what do you propose? Zach asked in a humble voice. Camille crossed her arms over her chest, looking unimpressed by the new member of our team. What do we do with your car? Camille wondered. It's a rental. Someone from the palace can pick it up. Paula responded. It must be nice having servants at your beck and call, I thought to myself. Before I could move, thumping sounded in the distance. I let out a groan, knowing that it had to be shifters. Paula let out a hiss, then gestured to Camille. Get her inside the limo, she ordered. Moments later, I was scooped into Zach's strong arms and carried to the limo. The door was pulled open by Keith and I was plopped in. I slid in beside Miles, who looked unsurprised by my bloody state. I told you that the boss wasn't going to give Wanda up so easily, he commented. Before I could even comment, a lion sped down the street. Its trajectory made clear when it leaped for Paula. Moments before it would have mauled her, the wolf shifter lifted a hand and a bright bolt of electricity slammed into the lion. It fell backward and landed on the ground. Miles swallowed. Shifter? He demanded. Yes, I answered as the lion changed forms. The lion shifted into a tall, thin, naked man who got to his feet and ran off. As I watched him go, my heart began to race. Why had shifters been in front of Benny the Bookie's safe house? We're missing a piece of the puzzle, I said, as Paula, Zach, and Camille joined us in the limo, which was getting tight. We should get rid of two of the prisoners, Paula ordered. We only need one of Benny's men, and this one over here looks like he knows more. You haven't even spoken to them, I objected, wanting every possible link to my mother around. Dear, it's all about the scent, Paula commented. Those two are afraid and overwhelmed, but your friend seems to be annoyed and regretful. I can scent emotions. Well... Wasn't that perfect? Paula could scent emotions, which made me realize that she could probably detect the annoyance I felt. That didn't make things awkward at all. Nope. If you drop them off, they will only tell Benny the bookie that we're looking for Wanda. Zach pointed out, Why don't we just kill them and be done with it? Paula asked. Neither man has a true purpose. I'd much rather be dropped off, Mitch interjected, 
Trust me, I won't say a word to Benny the bookie. Is Benny still alive? Miles asked. Summer was attacked by a shifter. See, he's the smart one, Paula cut in. We aren't killing anyone, I insisted. We can't just let them go, Camille warned. I'd rather let them go. No one will believe them if they try to tell someone about shifters. I reasoned, my strength nearly depleted. Fine. Keith, if you can do us the honors, just drop Dumb and Dumber off at a bus stop a couple of hours away. Meanwhile, I'll make reservations at a hotel so that Summer can recover. Paula said, it grated on my nerves how Paula was taking charge of the situation. I desperately wanted to find my mother and didn't think that leaving the city would help the mission. I need to go back, I insisted. Mom is in that safe house with strange shifters. I can't leave her with them. Worry and fear twisted in my gut at the thought of Benny having access to lion shifters. If he used them to find Cheyenne, my sister would never survive a run-in with one of them. Your mother is most definitely not in that safe house, and you know it. Paula snapped. I don't. Camille. Did you smell any humans with a similar scent to Summer in that house? Paula questioned, cutting me off. Camille, who was seated in the seat across from me, shook her head, regret filling her eyes. I only smell the shifters, she confirmed. Which means that Benny the bookie is either dead or hired shifter mercenaries. Judging by the fact that a lion shifter tried to maul me, it's probably the latter. Paula, the know-it-all, explained. And what makes you so sure? I demanded. Because there is only one pride in North America. They are called the Katrine Pride, named after one of the greatest feline assassins. This pride assassinates humans and shifters alike for the right price. Paula explained, which pissed me off. And the Wolfen Empire did nothing about them? I snapped, glaring at Paula. Most wolf shifters aren't trained fighters, Summer. Not even you stand a chance against a pride member of the Katrine Pride. And you're an alpha, Paula argued. But they're killing defenseless humans. How is that right? I protested, anger running through my veins. It isn't right, Camille agreed. But we have no way to solve the problem. The Katrine pride could slaughter our pack if we went up against them. I doubt that even Caden or I could take one of them on together. Caden's twin was practical enough for me to respect her opinions. If she didn't think that our pack had what it took to fight off the Katarine pride, then we didn't. But what if one of the lion shifters had my mother? Then what? Chapter 8. The Price David awoke to someone shaking his shoulder. Since the movement was gentle, he knew that it wasn't his mother waking him up. His tired eyes flew open, the darkness of the dungeon greeting him. Damn, I'm still in here? David asked. You a shifter? A woman demanded as soon as her hand left his shoulder. If I were a shifter, I wouldn't be stuck in here. Who are you? David wondered. I'm Wanda Wilson, the woman responded, as if David was supposed to know who she was. And I'm David Jabber. Where are you from? Florida. You? She wondered. 
Before Rune kidnapped my mother and me, I was from New York. David replied. Where is your mother now? Wanda asked, which made David's heart ache. Despite the hell that Sharon put him through, at one point, she had been an awesome mom. I think she's dead. My mother was the alpha female of this pride. I'm guessing someone new took over, David explained, which made Wanda gasp. You poor thing. I'm so sorry about your mother. I lost mine in a car crash when I was 14, she said, a note of sadness in her voice. Your mother must have been a good woman. At least you have that, David said as he sat up. The dungeon floor was unforgiving on someone's back. Have you heard of Benny the Bookie? Wanda asked, which made David want to laugh outright. Benny the Bookie? Man, was that idiot trying to sound intimidating? Never heard of him. Did he hire the Katrine Pride to kill you? David asked. The Katrine Pride? What's that? Wanda asked. David was interrupted by the sound of footsteps outside the dungeon door. That was never good. He straightened and rubbed his gritty eyes, unsure of what was in his future. The Katrine pride had been conquered, which meant that Sharon, the previous alpha female, was dead. His self-absorbed mother was gone and David felt nothing but anger. If only he had escaped, he wouldn't be in this predicament. The door swung open, and light filtered into the room, causing David to blink furiously. Wanda, who was wide awake, didn't even seem phased by anything. Instead, she stood as if she were accustomed to strangers visiting her in the dungeon. David played a different game. He was the wait-and-see kind of guy. Oh, look, it's David Sampson. A man with a southern accent taunted. He was tall, middle-aged, with bulging muscles that told David that he trained often. The confidence in his eyes and lack of a weapon, told David that he must have been a shifter. David Jabber, David corrected, pleased that at least he was never forced to take Rune's name. The muscular guy waved a dismissive hand, not wanting to bother with anything. You have two choices, David. You can become a wolf, serve in my army, and be given a good life, or you can become a wolf and leave my house. The second option means that you'll be a lone wolf that I'll have to chase down if you become a problem. Either way, I won't kill you, David. Unlike certain alphas, I don't murder innocent humans, he said, catching David off guard. He had been used to Rune, whose options always included pain and more pain. At least if he was a wolf, David could better defend himself. And what if this young man wishes to stay human? Wanda asked. She was the protective type, that was clear. If only his mother Sharon had acted that way. Maybe it was the years of being tossed aside but David couldn't help but think that it was up to him to come up with a question, since they were discussing his fate. Then I'll choose for him, their captor said. Wanda, you will be given slightly different options, the man said. What would those be? Wanda demanded, her arms crossed. You could either tell me where Cheyenne is or become a wolf, the stranger revealed. Oh, crap. That wasn't a deal at all. 
Before David could offer his two cents, the brash woman spoke. I'd rather be a monster than tell you anything, she said. Ryan nodded. Dan? Moments later, a tall man that was only slightly less built than this mysterious alpha rushed into the room. Hold on a second. I... The shifter shot David a glare that said, Shut up. Wanda made her choice. Well, David had tried to save Wanda from her mistake. It's okay. I'd do anything for my children, Wanda said, her hard eyes on Dan. Without preamble, Dan snatched up her wrist and bit into it. Wanda collapsed, David barely able to catch her fall. After he gently situated her, he eyed the conniving leader. Now that Wanda is out, I have some questions, David said, his mind racing. What would those be? The Alpha asked. Why won't you change me into a lion shifter? Why do I have to be a wolf? David wondered. Ryan sighed. Because... I can't stand lion shifters. Any other questions? Who are you? David wondered. I'm Ryan Bragstone, the future emperor of all shifters, he announced. And I'm guessing that the rest of the shifter population doesn't know that, David quipped. Instead of backhanding David, Ryan laughed. You're a good guy, David. So which one will you choose? Ryan asked. I can't stay human for now, David asked hopefully. Ryan shook his head. David was dreading the whole thing, having no desire to join a world where Ryan was trying to become emperor. But like usual, he had to roll with it. Fine. How about you turn me into a wolf and let me get the hell out of here? David offered. Ryan sighed. You're too much of a troublemaker for me anyway. But just to warn you, David, I will conquer every pack. So there won't be a reason for you to leave. I've got to catch up with my father. I haven't seen him in nine years, David said. You might have to turn him, Ryan cautioned, right before a lion ran into the dungeon, ramming into a barely standing Dan. He fell to the ground, the lion's jaws wrapping around the back of his neck. Ryan glared at the lion and spoke. Release him, he ordered, but the lion's teeth didn't release the man. David saw a glint on the lion's left ear and knew exactly what was happening. This wasn't one of Ryan's lions. He probably missed one. There was a stud embedded in the ear of the lion that blocked all alpha commands, aside for the shifter's true alpha. That was one brilliant plan. Ryan, the mighty emperor of shifters, Looked like he was about to pee his pants. David decided that he might as well call the lion out. His ear has a stud on it. It blocks off a commands. David warned, but it was too late for Dan. By the time the lion finished, the shifter's spine was torn out. The lion let out a roar and lunged for Ryan, who quickly slashed at the lion's ear, which came off and fell on the dungeon floor. Shift, Ryan ordered. Moments later, the lion shifted. The naked body of Rune's obnoxious brother Roy, lying on the ground, missing an ear. He glared at David, but David couldn't care less. It looks like I missed one, Ryan commented before biting into his wrist. Roy attempted to sit up, but Ryan glared at him. Lie still and drink, he said. Moments later, 
Roy accepted the blood of the Alpha who killed his brother. For a second, David felt guilt. But the rational side of him knew that Roy would have taken delight in killing David had he killed Ryan. But poor Dan. To die in such a way must have been horrifying. Roy, sleep, Ryan ordered. Moments later, the middle-aged naked man was conked out. So I'm going to be stuck with him? David asked, dreading Ryan's answer. Carry Wanda to your room, Ryan ordered. I'll have two guards posted outside your door until you're turned. At least an ill-timed assassination attempt postponed my turning, David thought to himself. He lifted Wanda into his arms and gave Dan's body a wide berth as he left the dungeon. David shifted Wanda to one side before opening his door. The scent of vanilla immediately hit him, which was confusing. Had Brian given him his mom's room? David stepped in and beheld an unexpected sight. His mother was lying in his bed, her arms and legs cuffed in the same restraints that he had endured for countless nights. Her eyes were open, hope briefly filling them. Did Roy succeed? She demanded. Nope. He's currently in the dungeon, since Ryan didn't take it too kindly that he killed a man. David replied. His mother frowned for a moment before she let out a defeated sigh. They killed Rune, David. He's gone, she told him. Then why are you still here? David wondered as he placed Wanda on the couch by the bed. Because I had the will to survive without him. My holder deserves revenge. He died in... A tear rolled down his mother's face, and for a moment, David felt pity for her. He had the feeling that Ryan had everything to do with why Sharon was still alive. David just wasn't sure what the Alpha planned for his mother. Now what? David asked as he plopped down on the floor beside Wanda. I turn you, Sharon said. If I turn you then you can attack Ryan and- No, David said, interrupting his senile mother. I saw how well attacking Ryan went for Roy, and I'm not interested. Besides, he offered me a fair deal. Deal? What deal? Sharon hissed. He'll turn me, then I can go back to dad, David said. He can't allow a human to go free knowing about shifters. Sharon's eyes filled with hatred. You are nothing more than a pathetic human. You were so quick to sell me out like that, Sharon shouted. You are as useless as your father. I should have let Rune kill you that night. But he told me that I'd regret it. But I, Ryan stormed into the room followed by a stunning redhead. Are you done, Sharon? The redhead taunted. Because we're going to need all of the account numbers. Sharon shot an evil glare in David's direction, as if he was to blame for her predicament. In some way he was. Roy could have taken Ryan out if it wasn't for David's intervention. I'm not willingly telling you anything, Sharon spat. Now, Sharon, what did we say? We have to be able to trust you. There is no way we can do that if you utterly refuse to meet us halfway. Ryan said, his expression filled with kindness. You killed my holder. Do you really think that I'd help you? Sharon shouted. Go on, Madeline, Ryan said. Madeline pulled a pair of gloves out of her purse and pulled them on. Then she fetched out a silver necklace that had a teardrop-shaped black jewel at the end. 
She walked over to Sharon and allowed the jewel to graze her cheek. Immediately, the scent of burning flesh filled the air and Sharon let out a scream. David's stomach twisted when Madeline stepped back to reveal her handiwork. A blister on Sharon's once blemish-free cheek. Tears were streaming down David's mother's face. No matter what she did to him in the past, she didn't deserve what was happening. Mom, just tell them what they need to know, David pleaded, not thinking that he could witness the torture anymore. But his mother merely shook her head. I'd rather die than tell them what they need to know. If you can't take seeing me suffer, either kill me or close your eyes, Sharon said through racking sobs. Don't you love your son enough to spare him of this? Madeline purred. David glanced at Ryan, who seemed to be entertained by it all. David couldn't say if the Alpha was suffering from a case of battle insanity or if he was truly evil. Go to hell, Sharon screamed. Just tell us what we want to know, Ryan said. Once you prove yourself, you can have a place in our pack. I'll never forgive you. You killed my holder, Sharon cried. David couldn't look away as Madeline pressed the jewel to Sharon's forehead and she passed out from the pain. Madeline let out a curse. Can we try using the boy against her? Madeline asked, as if David wasn't in the room. No, I made a deal with David and I shall keep it, Ryan said. But she loves her son, Madeline argued. I bet if we chop off a finger or two, she'd speak. Madeline, I said no, Ryan hissed. In fact, will you do the honors, or shall I? What honors? Madeline demanded. I need you to turn David into a wolf, Ryan explained. Madeline scowled but strutted over to David. She squatted down and grabbed his wrist with firm fingers. Before David could protest, her canine dug into his wrist, sending fire through his veins. Chapter 9 Stand Off Drop the gun, Caden ordered a wave of power slamming into the shifter, who staggered back. Shock filled the man's face, his blue eyes darkening with rage. He ground his teeth, trying to fight Cade's compulsion. The man's hand shook as the gun slowly pointed to the floor. Caden had no idea what to make of what he was seeing. His wolf could sense that the lion shifter wasn't all that dominant. Caden forced more power into his voice when he spoke again. Put down the gun. To the Alpha's immense confusion, the assassin merely teetered on his feet, as if he were trying to walk in ten-inch platform shoes while blindfolded. He held his arms out, as if he were preventing himself from colliding with something. Strain made the planes of the assassin's face hard. Cade tapped into his reserves and forced out another command. Drop the gun. This time, the assassin rocked on his heels before righting himself. He isn't more dominant than you, Blake noted. This makes no sense. Moments later, Caden felt the warming in his core that announced that a wolf was shifting. It was followed by the sound of tearing clothing and the thump of claws on the hard wood. Before he could say a word, a dirty blonde wolf ran past him and leaped at the assassin, who was struggling to stay on his feet. The wolf crashed into the man, sending him sprawling. 
the gun immediately went flying, which made Blake act. He dove for it, his hands wrapping around the gun right before the man pulled free of Caden's control. Blake, look out, Caden shouted as he dove for the man, who was now getting to his feet, his rage directed at the dirty blonde wolf who was snarling at him. It was easy for Kate to figure out that it was Larry who had shifted. A less dominant wolf like Pete wouldn't have dared to seek out conflict. Besides, Cade could feel Larry's wolf's anger pounding against him. Caden crashed into the man, sending him sprawling. Caden peered down at the man whose eyes were filled with hatred and pain. Who are you? Caden demanded. The assassin pulled what looked like a bath bomb out of his pocket. Caden's wolf detected the scent of sour magic. He didn't know how else to describe it. It was the work of a mage. Cade was sure of it. But something was wrong about it. Get down, he yelled, as the man tossed the explosive over Caden's shoulder. Cade got down, his body crashing into the assassin, who tried rolling Caden off him. A pounding boom echoed in the room as drywall splintered. The smell of smoke and blood filled Caden's nose. The wolf that had preemptively attacked the lion shifter was now barking furiously. Caden had had enough of the chaos, not wanting to try to wrangle a wolf and a lion into submission. The alpha was much too strong for the stranger. Caden quickly punched the struggling man in the nose before delivering a knockout punch to the jaw. As soon as the assassin was taking a stroll through dreamland, Caden got to his feet, his ears ringing from the blast. He glanced around to see Roxanne sprawled out on the floor, blood coating her lower left leg. Pete was crouched down beside Roxanne, his concerned eyes meeting Caden's. Can we take her to a hospital? Pete asked. Felix, who had managed to stay out of the pathway of the mini explosion, shook his head. Caden will have to command Roxanne not to feel any pain. After that's done, we can have Greg tend to the wound, since painkillers don't work on us. Felix patiently explained. Caden couldn't help but think that Felix was only trying to warm his way into the hearts of Caden's pack. If he came off as kind and understanding, someone would feel comfortable giving him information. Larry padded over to Roxanne and whined as he rested beside her, his tongue gently licking the side of her face. It was obvious that Larry's instincts were driving him to protect his holder. What now? Blake asked, shaking his head at the damage to the wall. Of course, it was yet another expense that Cade had to pay for. Sometimes he hated being an alpha, detesting the financial finagling he was often forced to do. Sometimes, Cade wanted to toss the title of Alpha into the Empress's face and tell her to manage the territory herself. But he knew that he would never disrespect the leader of the wolves. That would bring trouble down on his pack. Caden may have been a wolf that had powerful commands, but fighting the assassins proved that he couldn't always rely on them. We'll call the Andersons and see if they can organize a few packmates to repair the damage, Kate responded. I would put the assassin in the dungeon, but I doubt that it could keep him in. Caden, his mother screamed as she ran into the room. What's happening? A lion shifter assassin, Caden said unhappily. Without breaking stride, his mother lifted Roxanne into her arms and the wolf followed her out of the room. Pete, how bad is your wound? Blake inquired. 
Before Pete could answer, Felix approached him, reached out, and yanked the piece of shrapnel from his shoulder. Pete let out a roar of pain as his face lost color. What the hell? You pulled the metal out of him without having Cade use an alpha command on him first? Blake asked, disgust on his face. Felix shrugged. I could sense that the cut wasn't that deep, Felix said. Pete's wound was quickly closing, which told Caden that Felix had gotten all of the shrapnel. Now, Caden, you should report this to the Empress, Felix said, an imploring expression plastered across his face. You mean like the Empress told me that she sent her betas to my territory? Caden challenged. Felix waved a dismissive hand at Caden. Some things have to be done, Felix said. Now let's sedate this man to hell. Caden nodded and merely had to glance at Blake, who left to get the sedatives. Landon Carlson stood outside the one-story house that he shared with his mate. He glared down at his phone. It had been two days since he left Wolfen Falls, New Hampshire, and his alpha hadn't sent word. What happened? Why had Blake shifted in the middle of town? Landon didn't think that Benny the Bookie had anything to do with it. The guy hadn't even emailed him back yet. Maybe he wasn't interested in Summer anymore. He had no clue. But he couldn't keep on thinking about it. Holders had the ability to peer into the other's mind if they were far enough away. Landon figured that the connection was there in case a holder was in danger. But he still felt like that perk of the bond was inconvenient. Landon, what are you thinking about? Clara asked, which made him jump. He hadn't heard her exiting the house. Trying to sneak up on me? Landon accused. No, Clara said a flash of his holder's pain hitting him in the chest. He sighed and turned to face the beautiful woman. After slipping the iPhone into his pocket, Landon pulled his soft mate into his arms. What were you thinking about? Jolene? Clara asked, her voice sounding hollow. No, I was thinking about our pack. Why hasn't anyone called us? Why did Blake shift in the middle of the street? Clara sighed in relief before wrapping her arms around him. I don't know, baby. Maybe a less dominant wolf challenged him. I'm glad that you're showing an interest in our pack. Do you miss your parents? Landon wondered. I do but I love getting you all to myself. I can feel that you're a lot happier here, Clara noted. That's because I get you all to myself, Landon teased. Clara chuckled before tensing. Have you spoken to Jolene? She asked. The thought of that traitorous wolf made hatred roll through him. He had poured his heart out to her only for her to stab him in the back. Landon thought about sending Todd the emails she wrote, but didn't think Todd would be affected by them. Besides, he wanted Jolene to hurt. He wanted her to realize that Todd couldn't protect her. Landon wished that he could be in Jolene's head when she realized that Landon was the better man. I will never speak to her, she. Baby, I get why you hate her, but remember, seeing what you wrote about her was the issue I had. If you are feeling that way, why didn't you tell me? Landon's grip on his holder tightened. He loved every part of this woman. I just needed an outlet to work everything out. 
I was confused. Most of me wanted to drown in you and ignore Jolene, but a small part of me felt bad for her. I guess I felt responsible for how she felt. I don't know. In any case, I made it clear that you were the one, Landon insisted. Why couldn't you let her go? Why wasn't I enough? Clara asked. Anger at Jolene nearly made him explode. Look at what she did to his Clara. You're everything to me, Clara. You're the only person for me. You're enough. I was the one all screwed up, not you. You're the perfect girl for me, he insisted. I feel like if we return to our pack, I'll lose you to Jolene, she said. You won't, Landon said as he swept Clara into his arms. He carried her inside and proceeded to love every part of his holder. An hour later, Clara was sound asleep beside him. They were both stretched out in the king-size bed. Landon was awake, watching the love of his life sleep. She was so beautiful. Before he could kiss her awake, his phone rang. Figuring that it was Benny the bookie, Landon reluctantly got out of bed and tiptoed out of their bedroom. He was only in his boxers, so figured that he couldn't go outside. He'd have to settle for the living room. He sat on the couch and answered the phone. Hello? Landon asked. Hi, Landon. A melodic female voice greeted. I'm your Empress, Annabelle, and I'm displeased with you. Landon was going to pee his pants. He heard horror stories from Roxanne about the woman calmly slitting people's throats. Did his righteous alpha do something to upset her? Speechless, I see. Well, why don't you take this time to wake up your holder? Unless you want me to do so through our link. What do you mean? Landon hoarsely asked. Never mind. Your panic has woken her up. Clara ran into the room, dressed in a nightgown. She glanced around the room, trying to find the danger. Put this phone on speaker. Landon followed suit, his shaking fingers taking a second to hit the speaker button. He rested the phone on the coffee table and his holder sat beside him. Clara, can you hear me? This is your Empress Annabelle, she said, and Clara paled. Has something happened to our pack? Clara asked as she grabbed Landon's hand. The pack has been compromised, and I'm not sure how to deal with it. I need you and your holder to assess the situation and report back to me, she said. Why can't you ask Cade? Clara hotly replied. He'll tell you. Cade won't appreciate me involving myself in what he considers his business. That's why I'm asking you and your holder to serve me. Annabelle said. No, Landon insisted. We won't spy for you. That's disappointing. I thought that I wouldn't have to tell Clara what you did, Annabelle said. I didn't do anything, Landon protested. Really? Well, Clara, let me tell you a story. You see, your mate emailed Benny the bookie. Annabelle proceeded to explain what Landon had written. She also informed them that Benny the bookie had sent men to torture Jeannie. Then, Summer and Caden had captured the men. The Empress guessed that since a plane was chartered to Florida, 
that Summer was going after her mother. She pointed out that the events were all Landon's fault and that Cade would banish him if he found out. Wouldn't he kill me if I were a spy? Landon pointed out. No, you could just say that I used my alpha command on you, Annabelle reasoned. Your secret will be safe with me. Why did you want the man to attack Jeannie? His mate coldly asked. I didn't want Jeannie to get hurt. I wanted the man to attack Jolene. Jeannie wasn't supposed to get hurt. It was one of your undeveloped ideas, Clara said, pulling her hand from his. The absence of her touch made Landon feel empty. Empress, we'll do what you say, Clara said. Can we call you from this number? Of course, the Empress said, before disconnecting the call. Clara, we can't spy on Cade, Landon insisted. Clara rolled her eyes. It isn't like we have a choice. Cade could kill you for what you did. It doesn't matter that you weren't aiming to hurt the beta female of his pack. For once, just do as you say. We'll leave as soon as Doug permits us to. Landon knew that he'd be better off telling Cade and taking his chances. Sure, Cade might banish him. But what would happen to him if it was discovered that he was not only a spy, but caused Benny to target his beta female? Landon figured that the best thing he could do was reason with his holder. She would see things his way soon enough. He just needed to give her some space. Chapter 10. Nowhere in Sight I clutched my phone to my ear as I sat on the toilet lid of the bathroom. My roommate was currently listening to a music channel that played nothing but classical music. Oh, joy. I hated to admit it, but I was an uncultured teen who enjoyed EDM and pop music. There was no way that I could listen to violins for another second. It didn't matter that Paula had agreed to my plan on letting Mitch and his buddy live. I didn't feel right about killing in cold blood. We had dropped them off at a park two hours from Orlando before driving a couple of hours in the other direction. That was done so that we wouldn't happen to run into Mitch or Calvin. Miles and Zach were roommates. I would have protested, but Paula made certain to book a hotel room with a connecting door. It didn't matter how efficient she was. I still didn't trust something about her. Hey, baby, Kate greeted as soon as I called him. My canines tingled upon hearing his voice. It was unbearable. The need to be in his arms. Hey, I said, trying to speak from a throat that might have well been the desert. Where are you? Did you find your mom? He demanded. Worry and grief made my chest ache. Mom, how had those rogue shifters known that I would be after her? Was she still with Benny the bookie? Well, things didn't go as I planned, I confessed as I shifted on the seat. What happened, Summer? Cade gently asked. We went to the safe house, and I encountered wolves that I easily subdued. But I think that the wolves were only a distraction, because out of nowhere, a sniper shot me with a bullet dipped in wolfsbane and... Summer, come home, Cade ordered, his tone hard. Come home? Cade! I haven't found my mother yet. Why would I come home? I asked, confused. A lion shifter tried to assassinate me today. 
I'm thinking that this isn't a coincidence. We have to regroup, to figure out what to do next, Kate reasoned. But there was no way that I was giving up on this search that easily. I had only visited one safe house. That's it. I was positive that Miles knew of more locations where my mother could be hidden. No, Kate, I can't. Not until Miles gives us the location of every safe house that he knows about, I said, my anger beginning to build. I thought that Kate and I had sorted this out already. He didn't have the right to tell me what to do. The other two don't know about the safe houses, Caden wondered. We let the other guys go, I admitted. As in you killed them, Kate asked, confused by my words. No, as in we let them go. We didn't have the room to. Without talking to me, you released these prisoners? Summer, we have a change or kill law. If a human enemy finds out about shifters, we either change them into wolves or kill them. Caden explained, which pissed me off. Why in the hell hadn't he told me this before? Ugh, Caden, you should have told me this, I nearly screamed frustrated by the situation. It's common sense, Summer. Why would you let your enemy go free if your enemy knows your deepest secret? Cade challenged. Of course, when Cade was reasoning like that, it made sense. But still, he should have told me this vital piece of information. Cade, that's beside the point. I'm new to this world. You should have told me, I said, enunciating every single syllable. My body may have craved Caden Drake, but my mind wanted to argue with him for his attitude. You shouldn't have made a major decision without me, Cade fired back, and it pissed me off that he spoke slowly, as if I didn't comprehend his point. You... You know what? I can't. Admit when you're wrong, Kate said. I'm wrong? For what? I challenged. I just told you that a lion tried to kill me, and you didn't even ask me how I was. Kate pointed out. I pause, considering Caden's point. I just assumed that no one was hurt, I defended. You can't take our powers for granted, Summer. Any battle may be my last. There are no guarantees, Caden lectured. I didn't want to hear that reality at that moment. Fine, people died every day. But I didn't want to think about that happening to my pack. Sorry, but you were also wrong, Cade for not telling me that I'd have to kill Miles, Mitch, and Calvin when it was all over, I said, my voice cracking. I'd never allow you to kill someone that you spent all that time with. I figured that honors for what Miles did to Jeannie, Kate explained, which made me feel queasy, but he had a point. How are Jeannie and Jolene, I asked concerned that my friends may have been caught up in the lion attack. Jeannie is at Blake's parents' house, and Jolene is with Todd. She told her parents she was moving in with Todd without hesitation, and they went along with it, as long as she goes to college, Kate told me. Patricia? I asked. Not as accommodating, Kate said. We will have to tell her. Will we have to turn her? I asked. Not unless she decides not to live in Wolfen Falls. Once she leaves our town, we no longer have an eye on her, Kate explained. So will you come home? Would you, if your mom was missing? I tossed at him. No, but I'm an experienced wolf. 
I thought that this would be an in-and-out mission. But now, Summer, you got poisoned by Wolfsbane. Wolfsbane. These people are dangerous, and I would die if anything happened to you. Kate confessed, his voice growing hoarse. My canines ached to bite him, to make him mine. My soul was pleading with me, trying to push me into coming home and completing the bond. But I knew that I wasn't ready to make that kind of step. Not without my mother. Cade, I'm going to find my mother. It may take longer than I thought. But I'm going to find her, I insisted. Don't stay away long, Summer. Eventually, you'll need to go back to school. I can probably have Blake and his parents pick up the search, Kate said. Every part of me wanted to toss this mission to the winds and go back to Cade. But I knew that finding my mother was the right thing to do. If I put this in another shifter's lap, my mother would only be distrustful of the person if the shifter found her. Her hesitation could potentially get a pack mate killed. And despite my body's longing for Cade, I dismissed his offer. Besides, I was still a bit annoyed with him for suggesting that I should give up so early. I got that he worried about me, but I was the alpha female of a shifter pack. That meant that I was strong enough to handle the situation. I can't convince you to come back home, Kate asked, but his tone told me that he already knew the answer. No, I said as I got to my feet. I'm getting kind of tired, Kate. I better go. Goodbye, Summer, Kate softly said. Goodbye, Kate, I replied before ending the call. As soon as I walked into the hotel room, the scent of nail polish remover hit my nose. Paula was sitting on her bed with one of the hotel towels in her lap. She was dabbing at her nails with a drenched cotton ball. She didn't look up as I tossed myself on the other bed and peered at my phone. I may have been annoyed with Cade, but I really wished that he would call me back. Paula? Why didn't you tell me that there was a turn-or-kill law on any human enemy that came across us? I demanded. For a moment, Paula didn't so much as glance at me, but then she spoke. Because you're a know-it-all. You had all of these strong opinions and didn't once listen to the people around you. I figured that this could be a teachable moment for you. She said, making my temper ignite. You wasted time. Now I'm going to have to hunt down these guys and either kill or turn them. I shouted. Paula sighed. You also need to learn how to treat people, apparently, she commented. Here I am assigned to help you, and all you've done is ignore me or yell at me. I haven't been ignoring you. I've been tired, I clarified, as Camille walked into the room wearing shorts and a tank top. Her dark hair was up in a messy bun, and she held a paper sack. Caden says you love burgers and onion rings, Camille said. I nodded, and she handed me the bag. Camille, why didn't you tell me that I had to kill or turn Miles' buddies, I demanded. Camille shrugged. Your mind was made up, Camille said. I felt sick, knowing that I had broken a promise to Caden. I didn't listen to Camille. First thing tomorrow, we have to find the guys, I insisted. Camille shook her head. Paula sent wolves after them, Camille said. They're being saved for a tracking lesson that I plan to do with you. Paula admitted. After you catch them, you can decide their fates. You... 
I. Paula was clearly entertained by my current state. I wanted to curse the woman out, but decided against it. I had no idea what the beta female of the empire was capable of, and didn't want to make an enemy of her. Besides, she did make a valid point. I had no idea what I was doing and desperately needed her guidance. Fine. I should have at least asked for your opinion regarding the goons. Now that we're past that, what should we do next? I asked. Camille gestured at the bag of food, and I opened it and pulled out a wrapped burger. If you want my opinion, I say we visit another safe house with our dear friend, Miles, Paula suggested. Or we look for Benny the bookie and persuade him to give your mother up, Camille countered, which made my stomach quiver. Then we'd either have to turn or kill him. I don't think that I could keep my claws from coming out, I admitted. Let's capture him, Paula offered. We can bring him back to the Empress's dungeon. I'm sure a night in that cold, dank place will make him talk. Or we can turn him and use Alpha commands on him. Then kill him after. Camille tossed out. Despite what this man did to our family, I wanted him to be tossed in prison. But there was no way that I could get the human police involved. I like the idea of capturing him. That means less people to witness my claws, in case I'm not able to control them, I noted. Sounds decent to me, Paula said. Once Miles gives us possible locations, we'll be able to plan from there. Chapter 11 Impact Wanda let out a groan as her aching eyes peeled open. The moment bright light slammed into her eyes, she quickly closed them. Wanda took inventory of her body. She was sore, as if she had just contracted the flu. Her skin felt sticky. Her curly hair was practically glued to her forehead. The scent of blood mingled with sweat and sickly sweet vanilla body wash. Wanda counted to three and then opened her eyes a smidge until the light was bearable. Then she took the plunge and forced them open all the way. Disappointment filled Wanda at the sight of the familiar ceiling of the room where she had been held. Wanda slowly sat up, her head pounding at the effort. A jangling sound brought her eyes to the bed. A woman was shackled there, boils covering half of her face. Horror filled Wanda at the sight of the inhumanity. She got to her feet and slowly walked over to the woman. Her eyes immediately snapped open, and her annoyance made Wanda pause. You're a moron. You should have pretended to stay asleep, the stranger chastised. Dread filled Wanda the emotion twisting her stomach until it ached. Before she could ask another question, she heard the door open. She spun to see the man from the dungeon walking toward them. He was dressed in all black, his feet covered with steel-toed black boots. His face had a bit of scruff, and his dark hair was weighed down by an obscene amount of hair gel. He smiled wickedly. Who are you? Wanda asked, her voice hoarse. Wanda could feel her heart tighten painfully as she glanced at him. It felt like this man was her leader, and that she would do anything for him. He smiled, his eyes filled with excitement. I'm your alpha, Ryan Braxtone. As a human, you were so strong-willed he purred. But as a wolf, you're barely dominant. Wolf? Wanda felt her hands tingle, then sharp pain exploded in her fingertips. 
She glanced down and would have fainted if Ryan hadn't wrapped a supportive arm around her shoulders. She eyed her paws with shock. Then it all came back to her. Ryan had threatened Wanda in hopes of getting her to release information on Cheyenne's whereabouts. It was either confess or become a wolf. Wanda had chosen the latter, and it looked like the turn had been successful. You turned me, Wanda accused before pulling away from the monster's hold. Her anger bolstered her strength, making her legs as strong as granite. She could support herself now. Wanda had no need for his help. You chose to be turned. You could have told me what I wanted to know. Ryan reasoned. His manipulation tactics weren't going to work on someone as seasoned as Wanda. This was in no way her doing. You could have just stayed out of this, Wanda insisted. But instead, you decided to get involved with Benny the Bookie and his thugs. I needed to get involved with Benny the Bookie, Ryan corrected, because Benny had you. What do I have to do with anything? Wanda asked. Fear was starting to trickle into her chest, but she forced it back. Now was the time to get answers. According to my informant, the Empress of the Wolfen Territory is training Caden Drake and your daughter, Summer Wilson, to assassinate me. They are the only wolves that can pose a threat to me. He explained. Wanda's heart nearly stopped as she met the Alpha's dark eyes. He had to be lying. There was no way that Summer was a wolf. Wolves. My baby isn't a wolf, Wanda protested. Caden turned Summer some time ago. So, in order to combat the Empress's plans, I took you. I have two possible choices. I could bargain with Caden, exchange you for his promise to kill the Empress when the time comes. But then, he may be seen as a viable candidate for Emperor of the Wolfen Empire, which won't do. Or, I can keep you here and use you as bait. Summer is currently in Florida looking for you. I had hoped that the lion shifter I sent would eliminate her, but she proved too resilient to kill, Ryan said. Anger filled Wanda's body and she lunged at Ryan, claws extended. He batted her aside, her body flying into the air, her head colliding against the dry wall. Wanda's ears rang as her body hit the floor but she didn't care if this monster killed her. She would do anything to protect her girls, even if it meant putting her life on the line. She was about to get to her feet when the woman chained in the bed spoke. Don't bother to attack Ryan. He's your alpha, the injured woman said. Wanda wished that she could refute what the woman said, but could feel the truth of it in her soul. Oh, Wanda, Ryan purred as he strutted over to the crumpled mother of two. You damned yourself by choosing to become a wolf, he said. Wanda trembled as she slowly sat up, the pain thankfully receding from her head. What do you mean? Wanda demanded. I mean that now that you're a shifter, I can use Alpha commands on you, he revealed, and denial filled Wanda. That monster is lying. There is no way in hell he can control me. If that is true, why hasn't he ordered me not to attack him? No, she said. That's not true. Ryan laughed. Want a demonstration? He asked. 
Fine. Wanda, get to your feet and twerk. Wanda was shocked when her body obeyed and she began getting down like she was one of the video vixens. Wanda, you can stop. Wanda stopped, sweat dripping down her body from the exertion of dancing. Then the realization hit her. No, she said, her eyes wide. Yes, Ryan said. Thanks, by the way. You being a shifter will make everything more entertaining. Wanda plugged her ears, hoping that if she couldn't hear Ryan's commands, then she didn't have to obey them. Put your hands down, Wanda. It was like the command had been whispered in Wanda's mind. She obeyed, her heart plummeting. Where, Cheyenne? Be quick about it. I have another territory to conquer. She's in London, England. She's staying with one of my friends from college. Don't hurt her, Wanda begged. Once one of my packmates gives you a piece of paper and pen, you will write down Cheyenne's address and phone number, Ryan ordered before he strode out. A couple of hours later, in Wolfen Falls, New York, Landon and Clara were in the bedroom of their borrowed home. Clara was pacing as she stared into space. Landon was sitting on the bed, having the distinct feeling that his days were numbered. Clara stopped pacing abruptly and glanced at Landon with determination on her face. I'm going to check my phone messages. Then I'm going to have a talk with my mother. Your mother, Landon groaned as Clara gestured to the suitcases that were by the bedroom door. Landon, you won't delay me anymore. We're leaving, Clara said before strolling out the door. Landon had no choice but to gather the couple's luggage and follow his soulmate to her SUV. We should probably say goodbye to Doug. Landon said as his holder sat in the passenger seat of their vehicle. That was unnecessary, since Clara had texted Doug to ask him for permission to leave the territory. Landon tried not to be offended that the Alpha quickly responded with the go-ahead without asking them for a reason. To make matters worse, Clara wasn't speaking to him. Landon couldn't blame her for that. Clara was put in an uncomfortable situation because his half-baked idea forced her to choose between her alpha and her soulmate. He would take any silent treatment she gave him. Landon could feel her emotions swirling within him. Clara was afraid. He hated that he couldn't soothe her fear. He had failed as a holder, and he knew it. You know, Clara, maybe we should. An explosion rocked the ground, nearly knocking Landon off his feet. He cursed as the sound of screams reached his ears. Clara jumped out of the car, her face turning pale. Before she could speak, he heard another explosion. What's happening? She shouted over the sudden influx of gunfire. We're under attack, Landon said, his heart pounding. No, Doug's pack is under attack by humans, Clara cried. She quickly opened the trunk and pulled out her handgun. It wasn't much, but at least they could defend themselves. She rushed toward the gunfire, and Landon followed knowing that he was ill-equipped to assist his holder. It didn't take long to find the carnage. What used to be the high school was now a pile of rubble. People were frantically pushing aside debris, pulling out broken bodies. The shooting was growing closer. There was no place to run or hide. A few howls filled the air, the sound sharp 
and filled with pain. As soon as the first gunman came into view, Clara shot, the bullet slamming into his chest. His friend aimed at Clara, but before he could even shoot, Landon used his super speed to disarm the man. Landon delivered a punch to the man's jaw, and he was out like a light. He waited for more gunfire to erupt, but for a moment, he heard nothing. For a moment, Landon hoped that killing the two gunmen deterred the others. But then, more gunfire sliced through the silence, the screams of the frightened following close behind. A figure ran toward the school. Come on, Landon, we need to help them, Clara insisted. Landon turned to see the people digging through the rubble with their bare hands. Landon had no idea if there were any survivors in that rubble, but he had to try. They walked over to a group of men shifting a beam. Landon and Clara pulled the beam aside, giving them a visual of a dark hole. He heard the faint heartbeat. Someone was down there. Landon wanted to tell everyone to hurry up. They had the chance to save someone. By the time the survivor was revealed, Landon had splinters all over his hands. The survivor had been an unconscious high school student. A woman with black hair tended to the girl as the rest of the shifters kept on digging. Landon's hands were beginning to ache from the beams that he had to lift. As they worked, Screams and grunts of pain nearly shattered Landon. Our Alpha, a man with blonde hair shouted. Moments later, people began screaming. Our Alpha, he's dead. We've got to get out of here, Clara cried. We need to warn the Empress. Landon nodded, not wanting to deal with the evil woman but they knew that they were watching the destruction of a territory. Without an alpha, this territory would fall. Chapter 12, A New Outlook When my eyes opened the next morning, sadness immediately filled me. Caden was my soulmate, my world, my life and we hadn't ended our conversation on the best of terms. I hungered for his smell, his touch, his embrace. If anything, I wished that I could go home, if only to get one of his kisses. Without thought, I called Caden. Good morning, Summer, Caden said his voice making my heart fill like a balloon being pumped by an absurd amount of helium. I miss you, I admitted, my gums aching. If only I could sink my fangs into his neck and claim him. Being away from you is difficult. I miss you too, Summer. Have you guys come up with a plan? I heard Paula groan in the bed beside mine. It was barely daybreak, so I could understand her annoyance. If you bond with him, you could speak mentally whenever you want. The beta female loudly complained. Felix is no better, Caden joked. I wanted to ask Caden what the Empress's plan was, but I couldn't speak in front of my unwanted roommate. Instead, I concentrated on the conversation at hand. Have you heard from the Empress? I wondered. Not since you ordered me to stay in Wolfen Falls, Caden said. I know you said no before, but are you sure you don't want to go home? I could send some of the older pack members to help you. I considered Caden's words and had to understand his wisdom. This plan seemed a bit more complicated than just grabbing a human from clueless human guards. Benny the bookie had somehow paid off shifters. 
I didn't want to give up, though. It seemed wrong. But my soul was pleading for me to come back to Caden. What will happen if you disobey the Empress? I asked. Paula let out a loud curse. I glared at her, and she shook her head as if I were truly considering the idea. For most shifters, they wouldn't have the power to disobey the Empress. But I only obey her because she is the Empress, not because she's as strong as me, he explained. That doesn't answer my question, I pointed out. I actually don't know the answer to your question, but I think that the spies that she sent to us could make it all but impossible to disobey her, Kate figured. I'm not a spy, Paula butted in. Oh, get real. You aren't fooling anyone, I fired back. Kate let out a chuckle. Be nice, Summer, my boyfriend teased. I'll try, I said, as Camille rushed into the room, a bruised up Miles limping in behind her. Miles just gave me Benny the Bookie's address. Get dressed, everyone. It's time for a field trip, Camille announced. I thought that we were going to approach Benny at one of his clubs, Paula argued. Why? The less witnesses, the better, Camille said. She has a point, Kate said. Since all I wanted to do was get back to Caden, I slid out of bed. I say we go ahead with Camille's new plan, I said, eyeing Miles, who looked pitiful. Keith might complain about his condition. Camille waved a dismissive hand and I didn't miss that one of her fingernails had a dot of blood on it. It's his fault for not talking, Camille replied. What's the point when you're only going to break your promises? Miles challenged. I don't have the time to listen to this, I said, feeling that the guy that tortured Jeannie didn't have room to criticize our methods. Right, because you're desperate to get back to your boyfriend. Miles taunted. My anger carried me over to the annoying criminal, and I gripped him by the neck. You stole my mother, I said. How else would you like to be treated? I didn't kidnap your mother. The guy that did that was murdered and tossed out like trash by your pack, Miles bitterly said. Maybe. If one of your men hadn't murdered someone in front of a witness, we wouldn't be in this mess, I shouted. Maybe if someone knew how to mind their own business, Benny would have never bothered with the likes of you, Miles countered. Maybe. That's enough, Paula snapped. You two could go like this for hours and we're wasting daylight. Miles. Are you going to cooperate, or do I have to tie you up? For a moment, I actually felt bad for Miles. He was miserable, bruised, and looked as if he would fall over from fatigue. But then I recalled my mother, who was probably frightened and alone, and my sympathy vanished. I'll tell you what you need to know, Miles conceded. I was grateful that Keith agreed to continue driving us around. He pulled the limo up to the front of the hotel. The sun was blistering hot on my skin, and my body longed for the fall that I had been experiencing in New Hampshire. While I smiled at the elderly couple that exited the hotel hand in hand, Camille shot them an expression filled with suspicion. I was tempted to stretch my senses out, to see if I could pick up any sense that would warrant her attitude. But then, Keith hopped out of the driver's seat and opened the door. You first, Miles, I ordered. The unhappy captive slid into the limo, followed by Zach, Camille, Paula, then me. As soon as the door closed behind me, 
My heart began galloping, my fingertips itching to do something. I pulled my phone out of my purse and decided to text Cade. Me. We're on our way. Cade. Please be careful, Summer. I worry about you. Me. Don't worry, Cade. We're just checking things out. What are your plans for today? Cade. Talking to Patricia. Against my better judgment, I'm letting her in on the pack secret. Me. Sounds like drama. Are you sure you don't want to wait until I come home? Cade. So I can explain to Patricia and your mother at the same time? No thanks. Me. L-O-L. So true. I wish I could kiss you. Cade. I wish I could kiss you too, Summer. Me. We have to talk on the phone again. After we come back from Benny the Bookie's house. Cade. Okay. I miss you, Summer. Stay safe. Me. I miss you too, Caden. I put my phone back into my purse, hoping that the issue with my mother could be solved soon. All I wanted was to be in Caden's arms, feeling his lips on mine. The urge to complete the bond was so strong that I almost wanted to toss myself from the limo and run back to Wolfen Falls. Are you done? Paula snapped. Done with what? I asked, bemused by the woman's sour attitude. With acting like a pathetic, lovesick teenager that can't be parted from her phone. The beta replied. My canines elongated and I glared at her. How dare this rude woman disrespect me like that? I instinctively knew that I was stronger than she was. That assessment was proven correct when she flinched away from me and lowered her gaze. I am getting sick of you. The words came out harsher than I had ever spoken to anyone. A tingling sensation traveled up and down my arms and I felt like my skin was going to tear into pieces. Calm down, Summer. It's okay. You don't need to shift right now. Zack said. My eyes landed on my pack mate, and I felt some of the rage begin to seep out of me. Why is she so rude? I asked him. Because she doesn't want to be here, Camille observed. First of all, I'm appalled by the lack of discipline that you have, Summer. Right when you're about to go into battle, you spend the time texting, she asked. Shouldn't we be reviewing our plan? Now that Paula wasn't acting like a total witch, I understood her point. I let out a sigh and began to hash out the plan with my group. Keith and Miles were left in the limo. Since neither man needed to approach Benny the bookie, we walked down the manicured sidewalk of the affluent part of town. The large homes that sat back from the street and were accessible by gates with keypads worried me. What were the chances that Benny would allow us entrance? If we were lucky, hopefully we would be catching him on the way to work. Stop, Camille whispered in front of Benny the bookie's next door neighbor's house. Do you hear that? We were so close. My first instinct was to ignore Camille and keep on moving. But then I forced myself to use the senses that my wolf afforded me. I stretched out my hearing and heard a man screaming. Instantly, my pulse spiked. Worry for my mom, obliterating my judgment. Without hesitation, I raced to Benny the Bookie's house, and with one jump, I cleared the gate and began speeding up the driveway. 
In a matter of seconds, I was at the front door where I heard the sounds of shouting. No, mom can't be caught up in this. Please, no. With strength that I didn't know that existed within me, I shoved the locked door open and ran into the house. Stop. A man shouted. It sounded like the voice came from right around the corner. I ran out of the entryway and burst into a spacious hallway that had tacky nature paintings hanging on the walls. A tall man with long blonde hair stood over a man wearing a toupee that was askew, a wrinkled black suit, and black shoes. I would have recognized Benny the Bookie anywhere. The man had a knife in his hand, his arm about to slice into Benny the Bookie. An instinct rose up and I spoke. Stop! My words gushed out of me so forcefully that I stumbled backwards as if I had experienced a kickback. A painting came loose and crashed on the floor, along with a shifter that had been about to kill Benny. The blonde was bleeding from his nose and mouth, his body convulsing. A hand rested on my shoulder. You put too much command in your voice, Summer, Paula quietly said. I think you nearly fry that man's brain. I blinked and shook my head, disbelief coursing through me. I, what was that? I asked, as I studied the man that I had nearly destroyed with a measly word. It was your alpha command. Now, you can calmly order every shifter to show themselves, Paula informed me. Close your eyes. I closed my eyes, knowing that Zack and Camille had joined Paula in the hallway. They would protect me. Think about your outcome. Think about what you want. And most importantly, be specific, then speak. I felt a tingling sensation in my throat, which notified me of the power's presence. I want every shifter in this house to join me in the hallway with a painting, I ordered. This time, the Alpha Command rocked me back so hard that I fell on the marble floor, my head banging on the polished wood with a thud. So loud, Camille groaned. That was better than I expected, Paula commented. You could have caught her, Zack said, disgust in his voice. I slowly sat up, the pain in the back of my head quickly fading. I slowly got to my feet as two thin men appeared in the entryway. One of them was tall with jet black hair, while the other one was short with honey brown locks. Both of the men looked absolutely miserable. Judging by the blood leaking from their ears, I was guessing that the misery came from my aggressive alpha command. You. You commanded us. The shorter of the two men standing in front of us observed. I shot the man a hostile glance. Because I'm more dominant than you, I said with a shake of my head. If I may, Paula said interrupting our exchange. She stepped forward and eyed the men. Why are you surprised that another Alpha could command you? She wondered. Brian said that he was the most dominant wolf in the country. He commanded us to not obey any Alpha commands. And that girl overrode his command. The shorter wolf explained. I groaned before glancing down at the frightened bookie. Why are Ryan Braggstone's wolves here? I demanded. Benny blinked rapidly before taking a sobering breath. Well, I... They are here to kill me. Surely you can't let that happen, Benny pleaded. I could, but I need something from you. I said, my gaze hard. 
I need my mother's location. Benny blanched, which made my stomach sink. His expression told me that mom wasn't tucked away in the basement of this house. I won't tell you a thing, he said. I could turn you into a wolf. Then I could use my alpha commands on you and make you my slave for the rest of your pathetic life. I snarled, the tingling sensations returning to my arms. Please, Benny cried. Kill me now. Please. The three shifters that had been clearly sent to destroy Benny the bookie all shook their heads. We'll wait until the lady is done with you, the short man said. Our orders were to kill you. No one ever said when it would happen. Please, kill me. You'll do it quickly. That mutt won't, Benny cried. Benny, I will have someone turn you, I said. No, I can't. Oh, Benny's face turned red and he clutched his chest. Camille let out a breath. Benny is having a heart attack, she said, before biting into her wrist and shoving her wrist into his mouth. Zack blocked Benny's nose in hopes of getting the man to swallow. But a sense of doom was coming over me. I knew by the absence of his pulse that the bookie was long gone. He was the last link I had to my mother, and he died before I could interrogate him. Camille and Zack both stepped back, defeat lingering in their eyes. I eyed the men, whose faces were filled with surprise. I supposed that their jobs were done. I looked at Paula, whose face was pinched. Well, that's rather unfortunate, she complained. It is, I agreed. But maybe we can question these fine young men. I think it's fascinating that we've run into Ryan Shifters twice, Paula said. I nodded and opened my mouth, ready to do an alpha command when I heard the front door squeak. Chapter 13, Common Sense Come on, David. A familiar female voice coaxed in a sing-song tone. You need to open your eyes. David shifted in his seat and, wait a minute, what am I doing on a seat? David asked himself before forcing his eyes open. He furiously blinked to clear his fuzzy vision. He was strapped into a plush seat, his hands bound in front of him. A pocket of turbulence nearly sent Madeline sprawling, but she was able to grab the seat in front of her. So much for letting me go, David commented, anger rushing out of him. We are letting you go, Madeline assured. We just couldn't afford to let you see your mother in case you wanted to help her. Not likely. I think that she's getting everything she deserves, David said his heart hurting for the innocent people that his mother proudly assassinated. Were Ryan and Madeline evil? Hell yes. But at least they hadn't slaughtered defenseless families to earn a buck. You don't mean what you're saying, she said. Something's bothering me, David said, flicking his eyes to his bound wrists. Aside for the unnecessary bindings, how is my mother still alive? I thought that holders died at the same time. After Ryan beheaded Rune, he ordered Sharon to stay alive, Madeline explained. So, Rune is really gone, David asked, hoping that Madeline was telling the truth. Yes, Rune is really gone. Now that I answered your questions... 
Let me tell you what's going on. We're heading to Wolfen Falls, New York. We will land and conquer the territory. You will exit the plane and stay out of our way. Your father's in Manhattan, attending a conference. That's two and a half hours away from Wolfen Falls, New York. I don't care how you get there. Hitchhike or something, Madeline ordered. A surge of hope sprang up in David, the knowledge that he was really going to see his father warming his soul. But he knew better than to count on an alpha that owed him nothing. What's the catch? David asked, hoping that he could just avoid the battle. Well, the catch is for you to use your common sense. Don't get in our way, Madeline hissed. David felt a tickle in his ears, the heat of something seeping into his brain. His gums tingled and his fingertips ached. David glanced down and tried not to pass out when he saw claws where his fingers were supposed to be. He frowned down at the odd protrusion before recalling that Ryan had turned him against his will. The anger that flooded David was so strong that he jerked, the newly turned wolf's movement snapping his bindings apart. Judging by Madeline's startled glance, David assumed that he wasn't supposed to be able to do something like that. Well, that's better, David said, deciding to go with it. Madeline tilted her head, as if she were listening to something in the distance. All David's advanced hearing picked up was the snoring of men. She nodded and then plopped down on the seat beside his. We're landing in an hour. Try not to be annoying, she said. David ignored her and pressed his head to the window. Everyone, Ryan shouted into the silence. Wake up and listen to me. David shot up the power making his ears tingle. But oddly enough, he wasn't moved to obey Ryan. Knowledge immediately sprang into David's mind. He was more dominant than the Alpha that was attempting to take over the shifters. That meant that he could be a target if Ryan noticed. Crap. David needed to play it cool until it was time to escape the carnage. Don't make any sad comments. I want everyone to follow directions. Our goal is to conquer the territory. There are thousands of wolves here. I don't want to claim all of them. I have a few explosives packed in the cargo hold. Lily, you'll be in charge of setting them. Aim for a school or hospital. Ryan directed. David's stomach twisted at the thought of innocent children being injured. But what could he do? Madeline would only let him be free if he minded his own business. Besides, what could an inexperienced wolf do anyway? It wasn't like he could take out all of the wolves stuck in the plane. Judging by the fact that the shifters had to be put asleep during the flight, they were also most likely not in favor of conquering a territory for no good reason. It's none of your business, David. All you have to do is walk off the plane and hitchhike. These shifters will have to defend themselves. After his mental pep talk, David tuned back into the speech. I want the five of you to stay with me. Madeline, hide between the buildings and wreak havoc wherever you can. Great. The Alpha with the King Complex was actually a coward. We'll do, Madeline agreed. And then everything went black for David. A boom caused David's eyes to fly open. He blinked his mind foggy. The last thing he could recall was listening to the horrid speech that Ryan was giving. And then, and then, 
damn, what happened? David only sensed one person on the plane, and by the smell of him, he was a shifter. David slowly unbuckled his seatbelt and got to his feet. His knees were a little weak, but he slipped out of the row and gingerly walked down the aisle. The wolf stepped in front of him, aggression in his eyes. You don't leave until Ryan finishes conquering Wolfen Falls, he said, his arms crossed. David rolled his eyes as urgency filled him. His throat tightened, but he spoke. Get out of my way, David demanded. And to his surprise, the tough guy in front of him flew backwards, his body crashing into one of the seats. David sighed in relief, not focused on the fact that he had accidentally used an alpha command. He would roll with it. Instead, he sprang out of the empty plane and rushed down the steps and bolted forward. David ran on the outskirts of the property where the fighting was non-existent. He heard the howls and groans, but knew that he would never make a difference. There were too many of them, and he was inexperienced. So he focused on dodging the occasional wolf, not wanting to battle anyone. But when he heard the shriek of a little girl, his heart stopped. It looked like he was sticking his nose in this mess. He paused and focused on the shrieking. It was coming from the backyard of one of the houses. David strained his ears and could sense two wolf shifters. He dodged out of the shadows and sprinted down the silent street. No, the girl cried. The brat won't stay still, a wolf complained. As David's eyes narrowed in on a blue house with a burned out car in front of it. Oh, great. That would prevent him from hot-wiring a vehicle. Not that he was exceptionally good at it. The scorched metal nearly made David upchuck on the pavement. But he ran into the backyard and spotted the situation. A little girl was running in circles, evading both wolves. A tall wolf with bulging muscles finally got fed up, lunged forward, and snatched up the little girl, his eyes dark with malice. Put her down, David ordered, his throat beginning to tingle. The man placed the little girl on her feet. Come to me. The little girl sprinted for David, and he lifted her into his arms. She's the Alpha's daughter, the other wolf argued. The Alpha's and the Beta's families have to be eliminated. Not going to happen, David snapped. You aren't going to kill a little girl. Don't follow me and don't tell anyone that I took her. By the time David was finished speaking, both shifters were clutching their ears. His vehemence may have came through a bit too strongly. Don't kill me, the girl cried in his arms. They killed mom. It's okay. I'm going to try to get you somewhere safe, David said, before pouring on the speed. David heard the car traveling down the road leaving town. He needed to catch it, since it was one of the only vehicles that survived sabotage. He needed to catch up to the fleeing wolves. Sweat poured down his face as he ran, his lungs aching for air. Eventually, the SUV came into view. As soon as he made eye contact with the driver, David spoke. Stop the car and allow me and the kid to enter, he ordered. For a moment, the car kept on moving, which worried David. But then the car stopped, and David opened the back door, and the little girl sprang in. David joined her and slammed the door. Nina? The guy in the driver's seat asked. A female was sitting on the seat beside him. Landon! The girl cried. Drive, David said, 
and Landon thankfully complied. Who's the ass that used the Alpha Command? He demanded. I'm David, and we have to get the hell out of here. Ryan's wolves have ordered to kill the Alpha's entire family, David reported, which made the female suck in a breath. So it really is Ryan Bragstone? She asked. Unfortunately, he captured me and turned me against my will, David said figuring that he'd just give the strangers the short version. It wasn't like they needed to know about his captured mother. Why? Landon asked. Who knows? David said. Where are you guys headed? To New Hampshire. We have a feeling that our pack will be targeted next, the woman said. David was tempted to command Landon to take him to his father but David knew that Nina wouldn't be safe in New York. Adeline knew that David was desperate to be reunited with his father, which meant that it would be the first place she looked for Nina. Since David had snatched the terrified little girl, she was his responsibility. We're going to see Caden? Nina asked, her tone filled with hope. We are the female responded. Clara, why did the bad men hurt mom and dad? Why did they want to hurt me? Nina demanded. David could see that the kid was verging on having a temper tantrum. Oh, great. We don't know. David decided on, though he knew why. Liar! Nina shrieked. You're lying! Sleep, Nina, David said, using his alpha command. Moments later, the child began snoring. The blonde sitting in front of Nina craned her neck, her blue eyes filled with suspicion. You were turned by Ryan? she asked. Why? Don't know, David said. My guess is that it was a game for him. He gave me two choices be a wolf and stay in his pack, or turn and leave. I chose to leave, and he brought me with him to New York. David explained, I don't think he was willing to let me go. Did you drink his blood? Clara asked, worry on her face. David tensed, his eyes going wide. I didn't willingly drink his blood, but... I, he could have force-fed you blood, Clara said. That means he can track you down until you get a new alpha. Oh, crap, David whispered. Hopefully he'll be too busy to bother going after me. Hopefully. Cade will tell you if you have been claimed by an alpha, Clara said with confidence. David would have to see it for himself. So far... In his short, miserable life, he had made the unfortunate acquaintance of two alphas. And they were both power-hungry jerks. Chapter 14 Priorities I turned to face the entrance after commanding the three shifters to go to sleep. Moments later, Keith jogged up to us his eyes wide with surprise. He had a black eye, a barely there gash on his neck, and a blood-covered shirt. I sniffed the air and determined that the blood only belonged to the shifter. Paula stepped up to my side, her posture screaming hostility. Miles got away, Keith told me. He somehow smuggled a blade into the limo and nearly decapitated me when my back was turned. By the time I healed, the boy was long gone. Anxiety filled me, and I felt like tossing myself on the floor and screaming the emotion out in the air. Seriously? This was actually happening to me? For goodness sake, it seemed that nothing could go right on this mission, which was now at a dead end. 
I had no idea how to find my mother, who was probably scared to death. We've got to find Miles, I insisted. He's our final link. None of us are linked to him by blood or pack. So how would that work? Keith asked, bemused. You knew what kind of guy Miles was. We told you how he tried to escape us. And you turned your back on him? Camille asked, agitation in her eyes. To my annoyance, Paula nodded in agreement. Something isn't right about your story. You're a dragon. How did a human attack you without you noticing? Paula asked. I was on the phone with Sal, Keith admitted, a sheepish expression on his face. We were having a heated discussion about how much we would like to get involved in your situation. How involved? I asked, my heart nearly stopping. Sal thinks that we should move on. But I didn't feel that it was right, leaving you guys stranded, he explained. And during this argument, our only lead attacked you? Camille snapped. She looked as if she was about to claw Keith's eyes out. The dragon shifter may have been wary of her because he took a step back. I needed to defuse the situation before we lost yet another useful tool. You know, why don't we all calm down? My mother is missing, and Benny the bookie dropped dead from a heart attack. We have three shifters here that obviously wanted to kill Benny. Shifters at his safe house tried to kill us, which means that either Benny the bookie pissed off the wrong men, or he was working with shifters until they crossed him, I speculated. So let's search his house, Zach cut in. I'm sure he has a computer or phone around here somewhere. What about Miles? I demanded concerned that someone who was vindictive enough to reveal the existence of shifters was running loose. I had to either kill him or turn him. Miles is long gone, Paula said. What if he chooses to reveal the existence of shifters? I worried. Then it will be on you, Paula said. You utterly refuse to listen to reason. I'm sorry if I'm unwilling to kill humans at a drop of a hat. I'm sorry that I have a conscience. My voice was hysterical, my emotion swirling around my gut like a tornado. So you're willing to sacrifice the safety of your race for your conscience? Summer, you have a lot of growing up to do. Paula lectured. I wanted to punch Paula in the face and fly home to Caden all in one moment. Why had I left home without claiming Cade? How was I going to find my mother without him? Let's try to wake up one of the shifters, Camille suggested. But my heart wasn't in it. It was like a black hole opened up in my stomach and sucked my hope away. Summer? Are you okay? Zack asked, his eyes filling with concern. I'm officially over my head. I just can't. I need Cade. I pulled my phone out of the pocket of my pants and quickly selected Cade's contact. As soon as the phone rang, I began breathing easily. Three rings later, the sound of Cade's voice reached my ears. Summer? Kate asked. Miles is gone. He got away from Keith. I screwed up. Benny the bookie had a heart attack. I'm sorry, Caden. You were right, I rambled. Benny the bookie is dead? Kate asked in disbelief. Yes, I said, my eyes involuntarily landing on the bookie's dead body. Do you have any hostages? Kate wondered. The three shifters that tried to kill Benny, I replied. Take the shifters and come home. Miles will turn up eventually. Besides, 
He's too smart to reveal us, Cade reasoned. Hopefully the shifters know something. Hopefully, I said, my body filled with exhaustion. It feels wrong to leave. Babe, we thought that it would be an easy mission, but we were wrong, he said. I know. I hope she's all right, I whispered. I'm sure she is, Kate said, his tone reaching something in my soul. I'll tell the others, I said. Okay, see you soon, sweetheart, Kate said before hanging up the phone. I eyed the group and couldn't help but feel betrayed by the relief on Zack's face. I guess I hadn't been doing a great job after all. Maybe we should question at least one of the shifters here, Paula suggested. Why take all three back to Wolfen Falls? I nodded, deciding to listen to the beta female for a change. While you do that, I'll go make the necessary preparations, Keith said before leaving the room. I still can't believe he lost Miles, Camille hissed. Zack and Camille, I'd like you to search the house to see what you can find, I ordered. The wolves nodded and went off to do my bidding. I turned to face Paula, who looked less sour than usual. Choose that guy, she said, gesturing to the shortest man in the bunch. I nodded and could feel the power tickle my throat. Speak softly for now, Paula instructed. Wake up, I said, eyeing the man with the short brown hair. He bolted up his eyes wide with panic. Don't shift or attack me. Paula's tactic must have been working because my alpha command didn't send him flying across the room. Progress. Answer all of my questions truthfully. The man nodded, which caught me off guard. One would think that he would have cursed the alpha that was exerting control of him. What pack do you belong to? I demanded. Ryan Braxton's pack. I used to belong to the Wolfen Falls, West Virginia pack, but our territory was conquered. So this wolf wasn't exactly thrilled to be doing Ryan's bidding. Understood. Do you know where my mother is? I asked. She is being held at the Katrina State. Ryan conquered the Katrine pride as well. Don't go after her, Summer. It's a trap. The wolf warned. My knees were wobbly, as if they couldn't support me anymore. Mom was in the hands of shifters. A trap? What do you mean? I cried. Ryan discovered that the Empress intends on using you and Caden to take him out so he decided to take your mother in hopes of either brokering a deal with you or killing you and your holder outright, the man said. Paula's mouth hung open as if she couldn't believe this turn of events. So it's true? Kate and I are going to be used as weapons against Ryan Braxton? I asked, my heart filling with dread. Yes. The shifter I was questioning replied. I turned to see that Paula was still speechless. Well, I asked the beta female. Do you think that the Empress sent me here to babysit you for no good reason? She needs me to train you, Paula explained. Despite how unpleasant Paula had been, I still felt betrayed. So Kate and I are nothing more than weapons? I demanded, which made Paula roll her eyes. Don't be dramatic, Summer. The Empress is doing what's best for the Empire. She, she's doing what's best for her, I shouted. People in power always try to keep it at all costs. She's just trying to secure her crown. Why don't you talk to Luke and Roxanne? 
Go ahead. Ask them what kind of leader Ryan Braxton is, Paula insisted. Once again, the woman had a point. I was about to relent when Camille and Zach ran in our direction, shocked expressions on their faces. We've got to get out of here, Camille said, her voice sharp with tension, her eyes wide. My mother just called me. Apparently, Wolfen Falls, New York just fell. She thinks that Wolfen Falls, New Hampshire is next. That makes no sense. Ryan Bragstone's plan was to get me to go to the Katrine estate, I pointed out. The hairs on the back of my neck started tingling as my stomach twisted. I glanced from Paula to Camille and could tell that they also realized that something wasn't right. Run, the shifter on the ground warned, right before I heard something whiz past me. I screamed as Zach fell to the ground unconscious. Camille, I cried, my ears straining to try to figure out where the attacker was coming from. Assassin, Paula said before she booked it out of the house. Camille snatched up Zach and we turned to follow Paula when another dart sizzled through the air. But this time, it missed Camille by inches. I pumped my legs, dashing from the house of the bookie, my heart in my throat. Camille was beside me, her feet slamming against the floor. We made it to the exit and burst out of the house and into the desert-like heat. I was glad that we hadn't parked in front of the house. An invisible arm snagged me and I screamed. Shut up, the woman hissed. I'm not with the morons inside. Come with me if you want to see your mother alive. Camille, I cried. She slowly approached me, her eyes filled with worry. An invisible woman has me. Crap, she said right before I felt pain explode in the back of my neck. Katrina State, I cried out. Then darkness claimed me. What in the hell am I supposed to do? A female voice cried. This is a terrible idea. The Alpha has been out forever. She's the best chance I've got. Stop it, Mara. You can't panic now. You took the girl already, now you need to suffer the consequences. I was strapped into a seat that reclined. I could barely feel the shift of the transport, but could hear the sound of the engines. My heart sank when I realized that I was on a plane. Crap. I know I didn't give her too much. She should be awake soon, the female said. I ignored the person's words and glanced around. I was in a small plane. It had enough room to seat four people, including the pilot. To my shock and confusion, an unconscious Paula was strapped into the other seat. I hoped that Zach and Camille had gotten away. Hopefully they would find the Katrina state and find a way to assist us. Oh, good. You're awake, the woman said. She stood from her seat in the front and made her way over to me. She was short, with waist-length jet black hair and features that hinted at her Asian heritage. You're going to kill me? I asked, confused. The woman let out a chuckle. No, Alpha. I need to drink your blood. It's the only way that Ryan Braxton won't be able to claim me, Mara said. This woman had some nerve, kidnapping me and then asking me for a favor. And why would I help you? I challenged. Because I have information that you want, Mara replied. 